Hey, hello, 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 guys. Uh, I trust you're doing well. <laughs> Catch me off guard because I'm trying to check to make sure I'm on all of my uh, social media venues uh, before we get started. So I'm checking my personal page here. And guess what? I'm on. There you go. I am on. Yes. Yes, I am on. I am so excited. I'm so, so excited. So excited. Uh, as you would see our topic here, I want God's choice for me. Better believe that. I want God's choice for me. I don't know about y'all, but I want his best for me. He he know he 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 made me so he know exactly. Exactly. Could you imagine? Think about this for a second. Could you imagine if they had a school, right? All right. Now, this is a school aside from the regular academic vocational studies, but this is a school where they just major in teaching you how to get God's choice for you. Could you imagine that? That this school teach you how, what, I mean, everything is just biblical. They showing you how to get through to your, your what you want to do as a career, how to connect with your right mate. And you could imagine there was a school that actually taught you that. And you actually followed, just like how you would go study for economics, study for being an engineer and doing all of that other stuff, right? Excuse me, imagine, just imagine for a brief second that there was a school, watch this now, that this school, all they ever taught you there, when you sign up, you signing up because you want to be trained and well-skilled and how to achieve God's best for you. Can you imagine that? And everything that they're doing is via scripture. They're making up nothing. And every example they give you will be on a Moses, Abraham, Ezekiel, Gideon. And they break it right down for you. And they show you how this one, when they went against the plan of God, look at what happened to their life. And not only show you what happened to their life, but show you, look at now. Remember this guy over here, right? You remember Peter? Okay, now remember Peter had a son named Toby, right? And guess what? Remember this lady by the name of Mary? He married her. But guess what? Watch how his life turned out. Could you imagine that? Because what it would do for you, like it did for me, I would be like, I would make not just better decisions in life. I would make the best decisions in life. Because I finally found out that life isn't about how things appear on the outside, but more importantly, what, what, is, what is it that I'm supposed to be doing to achieve my purpose in life? If we had a class like that, I'm sure if they, you know what, if they were to do a study, all right, we'll take, let me see, 20 kids, 20 kids. And we can do a beta test. We can put these 20 kids in this school called God's Best for Your Life. And then we can take 20 kids from the regular curriculum of school and put these two in the regular, on this test. And you watch and see. Watch what the difference is going to be like. So you see, I'm saying all that to see how polluted we are when God is our manufacturer. He gave us a manual called the Bible. And we reading every other manual to fix the troubles, the depression, and everything else in our life. We're reading every other manual except the manual of the living God. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? So for me, I want God's best for my life. So today, I'm going to talk to you about two people in the Bible uh, whom God had... Uh, it's going to show the evidence that God and his plan for their lives, that their wives were incorporated. And I'm going to show you in these scriptures how specific, how specific the, not only inst the instructions were, but how important it was to follow those instructions to come across God appointed. And God appointed, I like that word, the word appointed means something that was already uh, prearranged, something that was designated, something that was already scheduled well ahead of time. So the reality is when you hear a word like 
designated, scheduled ED past tense, prearranged, is telling me these things already exist. They're already there. The problem that we have is how do I get there though? How, which road do I take? This is a big world for a lot of people. Everybody got their view, their opinion, their ideas. What road do I take to get there? So that is what we're going to do today. And this is going to be very interesting because again, uh, it, to, to be honest with you today, I wanted to just touch briefly on uh, adultery. <clears throat> I really want us to get on that going forward for Saturday. And the reason why I want to get on that because there's, there's a piece of revelation I want to just unleash, unleash to you. And I think I can just give you a tip of it right now, and I guess we will get deeper into it uh, probably sometime tomorrow. Anyway, when we hear the word adultery, uh, what adultery literally means is that in order for adultery to be... Uh, uh, produce or engage <clears throat> one of one <clears throat> if not both of the parties must be married so if the two parties are married but they're not married to each other and having sexual relation that's adultery or it could be one of the parties where one of the parties are married but the other one uh, is not married that is also adultery but I don't even know why. Should, should I release this? Should I tell them this right now? See, that's my problem. I can't even keep secrets. I, I get so inundated by these revelations that I, I just can't keep it to myself. But anyway, remember when Jesus, Jesus, when he came on the scene, he made a lot of amendments in regards to the Old Testament. Uh, one of those amendments uh, that he introduced was the how you deal with your enemy. And remember he said it was said of time, of time past that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So what that simply means that if you did me something wicked, I was in my legal right to do something wicked back to you. Then Jesus said, well, now I say, meaning that I'm amending, and the word amend means to change. I'm now amending that rule. The rule partially still exists in that if someone do you something wrong, that's cool, but you cannot return that wrong to them. He says, but I say to you, uh, if your enemy curse you, I'm telling you now to don't curse them, to bless them. He further went on and he says, if your enemy uh, persecute you or hate you or say all manner of things against you, he said, you don't go and curse them back. He says, instead, pray for them. So Jesus came back and he made an amendment to the previous law. He did it in marriage too, when it came to adultery and so on. But he said something that was so profound and the majority of people overlook it because again, they have this set mind, hand me down teaching on these things and refuse to go and explore it for themselves. And I'm going to pull it up here because we're going to briefly look at it because I don't want you to think I'm making this thing up. It's, I mean, it's all up in there all up and down, all right? So listen to what he says here. Right, he says, uh, okay, right. Okay, I, I can't find it, but I know it though, <laughs> I know it. Okay, because of blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm trying to find this. Okay, I think it's in, in Matthew 5. That's what I think it is, Matthew 5. Okay. Yes, that's exactly where it is. Right. Okay, so good. So watch this. I got it now. So Jesus, like I was saying, right? So Jesus says, now, listen, when it comes to adultery, now we're not talking about adultery. I just want to squeeze a small nugget in there for you because we're going to expand on this greatly tomorrow, right? We're not talking about adultery today. I'm still dealing with the importance of finding the perfect person and you want God's choice for you. That's what we're talking about today. So Jesus comes back and he said, now remember, in fact, let me read it for you. He said here in Matthew chapter 5, right? Listen to what he said. 
He said in Matthew 5, verse 27, he says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time or in the past, thou shalt not commit adultery. All right? So I think that's in uh, Exodus 5, somewhere around there, part of the Ten Commandments. So part of the Ten Commandments, meaning that you should not commit adultery. So for adultery to be uh, adultery, as it said back in the Old Testament, you either would have had the two people who are coming together are married to other people and they're having sexual relation, or at minimum, one of the parties are married. So if one of the parties are married and they're having sex with someone that's not their marital covenant union partner, it is still adultery. So the truth is adultery back then, because the, the, the definition as we're about to read has changed, the definition back then was that adultery is the unlawful sex with married people, or unmarried people having unlawful sex. So unlawful sex would be sex outside of the union, okay? So Jesus says in verse 27 of Matthew 5, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. So that's what he meant. You cannot be married to a man or a woman who have a union or, or accepted union and engaging in sexual intercourse with other people, right? So adultery was limited to a physical act back in the Old Testament. This is going to be powerful. So, but watch this scripture in 28 that we read all the time. I mean, just overflowing with Revelation. So let's go to 27 again, Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, I hear you, Jesus. Jesus is still speaking, verse 28. But I say unto you, mm, I heard what they said, but I can add some more to this. But I say unto you, watch this, watch this, Revelation, that whosoever look it on a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now, I know you read that before. And guess what? You read that, right? But you read that with the frame of mind of what was said in verse 27. Two people, one of the party must be married in order for us to call this act adultery. Johnny is married over here. But this woman who Johnny laying down with over here and having sex with is not the woman he came in holy matrimony with. This is high school sweetheart or whatever. So that's adultery. But guess what? Johnny here again who's still married. Hook up with another woman and she's married, but they're not married to each other. That's adultery. Jesus made an amendment. And what is the amendment? Jesus said, y'all ain't have to be having sex physically with nobody to commit adultery, and you don't have to be married. Mm. Read what he said in verse 28. Because what he's saying in verse 28, nobody is married in this instant. He's amending the adultery laws now. You're not married. You're not married. Even if whether you're married or single, he says. He says, if you, listen to what he says, whosoever, look up that word, meaning anyone. Look it up. Whosoever means anyone. Oh, you didn't know that, eh? See why I keep telling you, read your Bible for yourself. You see why? You see why I tell you, right? Read the Bible for yourself because you all about parade and run. Oh, you was married before and you, your wife, and this husband, and you committing adultery, not knowing that you're doing the same thing. And you didn't even touch the poison. You're single. You have no spouse. Jesus said, whosoever, look up the word. Whosoever means everyone, anyone. Whosoever look on a woman to lust after her. Whosoever means whether you are single or whether you are married. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. See, because when you categorizing people, you better hope to God you ain't putting yourself unknowingly in that category. Because you're trained, like I say, hand me down gospels. You don't go, you don't go read nothing. You're trained that this man was married before. He's married to somebody else. His wife is still living, or she was married before her husband's still living. 
they, you're all adulterous, you're all wicked, you're all going to hell, you're all a bunch of demons. Jesus says, now hold off now. Hold off on the condemnation and judgment. You single. And many nights you sit and masturbate, sometimes during the day. You clearly ain't drink, thinking about your Bible. You clearly ain't conjuring up thoughts to have an orgasm by thinking about Sunday school. So who are you thinking about? And whoever you're thinking about, whether you haven't provided sex in your mind with a man or woman, you're lusting on someone else, Jesus says, that also is adultery. <laughs> you can be hot tomorrow. <laughs> I hope you're ready. Or listen, like I told you before with these teachings, I ain't come here to condemn because I'm not about that. I ain't come here to beat you down. What these messages are going to do for you it, that same finger that you always pointed at on us, it can finally shake and come right back down and you say, no, I just do it too. I cannot judge them. And that's what I tried to teach you. Stop judging people. Stop it. You know what God said to Moses? I can't remember what the situation was, but it was something that required a punishment because of the law of God. And God said to Moses, he says, Moses, listen to me good. I, God, will have mercy on whom I choose to have mercy on. And that, that never left me. The Bible is explicitly clear here. Jesus said in Mark 5, You have heard that it was said by time, by them of all time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It is a sin to commit adultery. He explained why. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman, to lust after her, had committed adultery with her. But where did it happen? In his heart. But he didn't touch her. It doesn't matter. But he isn't married. It doesn't matter. But she's not married. It doesn't matter. So the pastors up there preaching and condemning everybody in this church that was married before that they're adulterous, and he have a major lust problem. And the one who's calling on his adulterer is king adulterer, based on the rules. Let me read it again, because you look like you don't know what I'm talking about. Let's say it again. Matthew 5, 28. But I say unto you, Jesus speaking, that whosoever, you know what, you know what, you're all joking. So let me, and my thing here, let me pull up the Hebrew word for whosoever, because you all seem to be confused. So whosoever, because this is in the Greek, okay, this is in the Greek, and the word whosoever means uh, anyone, everyone, everything, collectively. That's what I'm reading. So let's go back now. Let's read the text again now that we have that understanding of what that word means. So he says here in verse 28 of Matthew 5, okay, he says here, very clear, but I say, Jesus says, I say unto you that Whoever, which who, but I don't care who you are. I don't care what title you have. I don't care what you call yourself, man, woman, she, it, whatever. He said, if you lust after someone else, if you're sitting down and conjuring up sexual perverted thoughts and drooling all over them, Jesus said, you are equivalent to the ones that you are actually accusing of being an adulterer and adulteress. He was so serious about this amendment. Listen, listen to verse 29. Listen to what he says. He says, and if your right eye offend thee, pluck it out. If you can't control your eyes and lust, if you can't control what you if, if you are a pornographic maniac, you love porn and sexual filthy, whatever. He says, Boy, watch, watch, would you watch how you judging others? Watch how you judging others whosoever. He didn't make no specifications. He didn't say, uh, if you're married, he'd know that was no qualifier. Whosoever, whoever, whoever lusts after someone else, whether them or the person is married, it don't matter. Whether they single, it don't matter. You fall under the same category. So I can leave that right there because I got so much to put on that tomorrow when I come back at you. I just wanted to drop that there because, again, in this series, I'm not here. We are not here to condemn. We are not here to pull anybody down. 
We are here to get an understanding. I am not here to give you my doctrine. I am not here to convince you to what I believe because I only believe what the Bible say. But the way I'm teaching it is just like how I taught that little verse just now. We are not going to skip over words that are very significant in any understanding. We are going to explore the words that we always read but never got the definition because we cling on to the opinions of others and then you skip over that because you figure you know what they're saying. No, you don't know what they're saying because if you know what they were saying, you wouldn't have been shocked just now when I said to you, you, neither the person you're having, sorry, you're fantasizing over have to be married for adultery to take place. You could be a single person and the person you're lusting after could be single. But Jesus is saying none of that matters. The, the qualifier that made you an adulterer was when you begin to lust after them in your heart. So he says adultery began from your heart. That's what it said. Now, I, again, I'm telling you that because that's going to change the whole dynamics of everything. We'll get into this tomorrow. Okay, I keep telling you the same my opinion. I just want you to be, when you engage in these arguments, don't be a fool. When I say don't be a fool, don't say what they say. Say what you have read and what you have understood. This is what makes you a wise person. Okay? A fool is one who took take on the baton and don't know what that baton uh, contains. All right? So let's go to Genesis chapter 24. This is so powerful. This is so powerful. Genesis chapter 24. I love scripture. Yeah? I love it. 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 Okay, Genesis 24. So again, today, I want God's choice. You all know this. I've been happening on this. I mean, about... 90% of my message so far is pounding with the right mate. And the reason for that is the importance of being rightly connected. I, I started off this series uh, almost, almost three weeks ago now, uh, stressing the importance that God has a plan for all of our lives, including Kevin Ewing. God is such an awesome God. Listen, I so thank him for his mercy and his grace. I am so thankful for him because I'm happy that we're not dealing with a God who is uh, reactive like us. I'm thankful that he is an all-knowing God. So what that mean, and again, I'm not trying to justify nobody's situation. I'm saying to you, wherever category you fall in, whether you were divorced, married, or however they label you. God was the one that made you. And because he knew, he knew you would have gone down this road, whether you were aware of it or not, whether you were, he knew. And this God who knew in advance already had a contingency plan for you. He knew. He, he knew. And this is why the scripture comes back. And this scripture is so, so beautiful. Joel 2 and 25, he says, listen, listen to what he's saying. I, Mary, Paul, Tom, Tommy, Heather, y'all, please hear me. I did not come to condemn you. I did not come to beat you over the head. I did not come to hold one sin over your life and remind you of it daily like people do. He said, I will restore unto you. So if he's saying that well in advance, he's, you know what he's also saying? I knew you would have messed up in life. I knew you wouldn't have listened. I knew you would have taken away that would have seemed right to you. But let me tell you right now, now that you are a child of God, there is no condemnation on you, a child of God in Christ Jesus, number one. Joel 2 and 25, he says, I, God, will restore unto you. The years that the canker worm, the caterpillar, the locust, and the palmer worm has eaten away. He's saying the years that those insects and creatures that truly represent evil spirits that were eating away at your spiritual blessing that has caused you to result in physically in what you have now. He said, I knew they were coming. And I knew when you take this way, what would have happened. That's why I was begging you before you take this way to choose life, to choose blessings. But anyway, I'm not here as your God to beat you over the head. I'm not here as your God to remind you that you are a whore, that you are an adulterer, that you are a thief, that you are a pedophile, that you are a liar. If I was that type of God, I would be no different from regular men. 
Instead, I'm a God who is a restorer. I am a God who want to sweep all those things away and make things new in your life again. So I'm telling you, I have already incorporated in my plan, because I knew you would have messed up, to restore unto you, to recompense, to pay you back, to reestablish the losses that you have suffered. Somebody need to hear me. Somebody, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying, Kevin. I hear you, but I, I married to this man and they tell me I inconsistent adultery. Who said it again? They said that, right? Miss, I ain't trying to tell you you right. I ain't trying to tell you you wrong. So I ain't trying to encourage you and what you may think you're doing is evil. I ain't trying to make a wave. I am telling you what this Bible, I keep telling you that because I ain't diverting from it. I ain't going to divert from the God that I serve. Now, I don't know God you serve. Maybe the God that you and your past system serve, who is a, a God whose whole life is to watch humans mess up, to send them to an eternal flame. I don't know about that God. I'm not familiar with him, and I'm not interested in him. But the God who is a restorer, the God who knows the end from the beginning, the God who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the God that nothing Kevin could do could surprise God. God ain't surprised. Oh my God, how dare you get married? And that ain't the one I had for you. Look how you go and mess up. Go straight to hell. You no good adulterer dog you. I don't know that God. I don't know him. And that one, I don't want nothing to do with. I don't want nothing to do with him. But the God that I talking about, the God that I talking about, guess what? It was the same God who said, David, a man after my own heart, the man who had multiple wives, the man who committed adultery with uh, Uriah's wife, had Uriah killed. I'm making no excuses. I'm telling you what the Bible say. I'm telling you how God to see things different. God ain't come to condemn. God ain't come to beat you down. God ain't come to deal with you. This man, God says, him, the same David here, the same no good David, the same killer. Not only did he had sex with the man wife, that wasn't good enough for him. He get her pregnant, that wasn't good enough for him. He ended up murdering an innocent man. He had other wives while he had Bathsheba, he had other wives. The same God who knew he would have messed up. The same God who knew he would have killed Uriah. Uriah. The same God who knew he would have seen Bathsheba on that roof taken about. The same God who knew all things, made a decision before this man even did what he did. David is a man after my own heart. Kevin, you're trying to encourage us to do, you won't get away with this kid, buddy. I don't know where you're coming from with this. Kevin ain't trying to encourage anybody. This is what Kevin is trying to tell you in looking at the bigger picture. I want to look at what God look at and put focus on that. What is that? He is looking at the heart of man. While you may be a liar, a killer, a pedophile, adulterer, and an adulteress on the outside, God is zooming into that heart. He doesn't see in that heart what man has labeled you on the outside. I'm trying to help you. He's a merciful God. He's a patient God. He is a kind God. He loves his creation. He, this is the reason why even while you condemn me and others and God see your secret and still will not expose you. Still in it. He's he letting you run out with your garbage. Because he could flip on you any day and say, you know what? You're running over these. Let me, let me show you. Let me let them see your life. No, he ain't petty like us. One day you can you one day you will have this awesome appreciation for him, like I do. When you know where he has brought you from, when you know you was in a situation that you were deserving of the punishment, and he stepped in the way and says, No, 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 no. While they deserve it, I am not gonna let you put your hand on them. I will have mercy on whom I choose to have mercy on. I made nobody in this earth God other than me. I am the only God. Jehovah Elohim, Jehovah El Shaddai, Jehovah Mekadesh, Jehovah Sidkenu, the God my banner, the God my provider. Kevin, why are you saying all this? Because I am in these teachings, I'm trying to get you. Rather than labeling and condemning, Look, 
well, you can't see because you're full of hate. But try to look at what God is looking at. The heart. That's what he sees. What do you see? Tradition. Your standard. How you feel. How you interpret it. You're not God, do way. Eh? Right? I mean, you are. I hope not because if you are God, I'm in trouble. And that's what makes him so special, so sweet, so palatable. He, 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 it kind of reminds me, and I think I told you the story before about my son, and the way that I decided to raise my children was always make them cognizant of this fact. You could tell daddy anything. I don't care how vile it is. I don't care how disgusting or shameful it is. And my oldest son, KJ, who's going to be 28 this year, and not only did I tell him that, because it always was me and him in the beginning, I always demonstrated that. So there were things that my son would tell me that he did, that I did not want to hear. I didn't want to hear. And I would just laugh and so on and calmly correct him and tell him the right way. And what I didn't realize by doing that, rather than condemning him, rather than saying how stupid you could be, how foolish you could be, I have lived to see this boy, times when we, we have conversation, he lives in Florida, and he would say to me, God is my witness, I have no reason to lie to you. He would say to me, Daddy, I really, I really appreciate you. I really appreciate how you raised me, how I was always open to tell you how I feel in my relationships. Even when the boy did things I didn't like. But if I choose to have this kind of relationship, an open door, I can't shut the door every time he says something I don't like or I don't approve of. That's what the preachers are doing to you today. And they're all hypocrites. Because in condemning you, they're saying, I don't have sin in my life. What they should be doing to you is showing you. Yeah, you messing up here, man. But this is how God looking at you. And he don't want you to continue in this, you know. And, and it isn't that it is a matter of hell and hell, hell and heaven thing. He wants you to enjoy the abundant life. So this is why the same loving God came right back. Right here, let me read it for you. He came right back here in Romans. And I, I can start our message today. In fact, this is a part of it. <laughs> he came right back here in Romans 8 and verse 1. And listen to what he says. There is therefore now... No condemnation to them, there's a requirement, which are in Christ Jesus. Hold on. This, so what you're saying to me, if this person excuse me, is not in Christ Jesus, there is condemnation for them, yeah. But because they take on, they, they, they ain't got it all together. They accepted Jesus. They, they did the requirement to be a, a, a recipient of the not being condemned by God. He said, you're, you're saved, come here. Now, yes, I know you lie a lot, okay? I know you have problems. You have sticky fingers. You steal. Watch what he says, though. Because you are in Christ Jesus, because you're striving to be right with God and the things that God require, I'm not condemning you. Let's see how we could modify the deeds of your flesh. Let's see how you could get. See, this is how the God that we, the same God who spared your life, when you slept with other people, you might have slept with someone who was infected with HIV. And you heard about other people who slept with them and find out this person was sick and your friends died. And you finally get over your nerve to go take a test and you come back negative. Why did he preserve you? Why? but yet you are above reproach. So you're going everywhere and condemning. You can, the same God who spared you, the, just like the guy in the Bible who owe his master $10,000, beg his master, master, please, please, for the love of God, give me a break. And the master stopped him from going to prison right off the debt. He walked away and met a guy who owed him $10, grabbed him by the throat, where's my you-know-what money? Some of the servants who saw the original master forgave him, went back and tell him what he did. 
And the Bible said the master cast him in the prison among the tormentors. That's exactly how you are. When you condemn and ridicule people because you saved, because you only was married once, because all your children for one man. Yeah, yeah. So you figure that has now qualified you to talk down to someone and to tell them how this and that they are. When the God of Abraham kept a secret, your secret sins, didn't expose you like the others was exposed. So you're thankful, God. This is how I'm going to thank you. Because you hide my dirt, because you forgave me, I'm going to go there and expose other people. I'm going to tell them they are this and they are that. Mighty God, I preach in the day. Huh? You don't got to cheer me on. I cheer myself on. <laughs> okay? I, I, I got to bring it home. See, I, I, I tell you, I ain't your regular preacher. I'm, I'm a realist. That's what makes me different. I'm real. I'm real. I don't hide nothing. I ain't trying to hide. I ain't like pastors out there who got babies all over the place while they was married, but will come preach righteousness. No, 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 no. Whatever dirt I do, you can hear it. I can shame myself. Take it or leave it. Because guess what? It ain't you who could put me in heaven. It ain't you who could put me in hell. The only judgment I fear and concern about is that judgment. That's from him. So let me live according to what pleases him. That's what I'm interested in. All right? So let's go now to Genesis 24. Genesis 24. Right? Listen to this. This is powerful. This is powerful. Genesis 24, beginning at verse 1. We're going to read to verse 27. I might skip some parts of it. And it says, And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So remember here, he's very old, stricken in age, meaning that he's feeble. He cannot move and, and function the way he used to. More than likely, well, actually not more than likely, but he needed assistance. This is going to play a major role here. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant, so for them to say his eldest servant, that means he has other servants, all right? He said unto his eldest servant of the house that ruled over all that he had, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife, circle that, I love it, thou shalt not take a wife unto my son, of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. So his son here would have not been uh, Ishmael, because you know that was his first son with Hagar when he went outside of the will of God. The son he's referring to here is Isaac. Abraham, who is fully aware of the covenant that God made with him in Genesis 15, he know that this covenant, there are some stipulations that came with it. And the covenant had to do with his bloodline, his lineage, right? Which also affects us here today. So Abraham realized the importance of the, the, the second uh, most important decision you would ever make in your life. I told you the first one, if you've got any kind of sense, is to get your eternal soul sorted out with God. The second greatest decision you would ever make is to hook up with the right person. So Abraham, who knew this, couldn't leave this a chance. He knew the importance of being rightly connected to the things and the people God has called you to, to ease or to facilitate the plan that God already has in place for your life. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. I want you to listen now. So he says, even though I'm going to get this guy to swear, let him, let him take an oath. Let him make a covenant. Because if he messes up this covenant, there's a penalty to pay. So the importance of Isaac connecting with what God had already put in place. Abraham said, I ain't leaving this to chance. No, 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 no. I ain't leaving this to chance. So we got to do it, filling out all kinds of paperwork and stuff to ensure that he carry out these instructions. So he says, don't let my son marry. Now remember, Clearly, these Canaanites were super wicked because this was even before the law of Moses, when even God instructed Moses to tell the children of Israel, going into the land of Canaan, don't marry their women, don't make covenants. This was way before that. But yet, clearly, Abraham had some insight. He had some insight that the Canaanites were not just wicked people, you know. 
But if you fool up with them, that could rim over or leak into your own lineage, which would have had, would have, which, 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 meaning that you would have never been if, if, an infected before with this spiritual infection until you hook up with them. So Abraham didn't want this. So watch what he says here now. I so love this. So he says in verse 3 of Genesis 24, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. I don't want him marrying none of them. But, verse 4 of Genesis 24, but thou shalt go unto my country, meaning where he came from, and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Preadventure, or suppose the woman, the woman will not be willing to follow me unto this land. Must I needs bring my son, thy son, sorry, again unto the land from whence thou camest? Meaning, shall I, what if the woman don't want to come with me? What if I go, Abraham, and find the woman? But I tell her, now, lucky you need to come because I got your husband over here. And she say, I ain't coming. Should I then come and take Isaac and bring him to her? Because that's what he's asking. Verse 6. And Abraham said unto him, Beware, thou that thou bring not my son there again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, and from the land of my kindred, and which spoke unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son. From Boy, listen, I don't know about you, but I'm getting some chill bumps right now. Abraham is saying, let me tell you why this is important. God made a covenant with me. And he told me the covenant that he's establishing with me is setting the course that this land that he has given to my descendants. He said, I'm so convinced that you're going to find this boy wife there that God is going to send an angel ahead of you. Going to do all the footwork for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm this is why you need, if you are not married, Father God, I pray. I pray, Lord, even as I listen to these messages, Lord, that you would renew my mind, remove all of the things that I thought were the right ingredients to the one that you have called to me. But it ain't like that. What I'm seeing here, I must put my full trust, my full confidence. I must remove everything that I think was the right way to go and just totally surrender my will, my thoughts, my heart, my soul, my spirit, and everything else that concerns me to you and let you now direct my path. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. Boy, if you listen to these things, what I'm telling you, which i take taken from Scripture, you, I promise you, you will get God's best for your life, and you will have a far better life than if you hooked up with something that you were never supposed to be a part of. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. So he says that God will send an angel. God will send an angel, right? So watch this now. He says here in verse, where are we? Verse 8. And if the woman will not be willing, follow me. No, no, no. Verse, where is it? Let's start in verse 7. Sorry, the Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house, excuse me, and from the land of my kindred, and which spoke unto me, and that swear unto me, saying unto thy seed will I give. This is God's promising him. Abraham, unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee. My God. And thou shalt take a wife unto thy son. So if he's sending the angel not only to lead you, he's saying this angel must he will always also inspire you how to pick this one. Because remember, the servant is going there with no blueprint or there's nothing that he could say, okay, I got a picture of her. She got a pretty little nose, a nice little short hair cut. So once I, whoever looked like this picture, that's a, a Isaac wife. He had none of that. This man was walking on straight feet. That's how you should be. But what was his guide? He tell him. The God who made the covenant will send his angel. 
So watch this. He goes on to say here in verse 8, And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from thy oath. This is what Abraham telling him. Only bring not my son there again. Do not take my son over there. But I'm telling you, he said, if the woman who you've deemed that this is the one and she chooses not to come, this is the only way you will be freed from this oath or this covenant that when you put your hand on my tie, uh, Abraham tie, that's the only way you're going to be released from this oath or this covenant that you've made. Verse 9 says, And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swear to him concerning that matter. Good. Verse 10 of Genesis 24. And the servant took 10 camels of, sorry, and the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his masters were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Naor. And he made his camel to kneel down. Oh, this getting juicy. Without the city by the walls or outside the city by the walls of water at the time of the of the evening, even the time that women go out to water. So the Bible is saying now that he's finally arrived to the city of Naor and he got the camels to kneel down and he's right there by watching the women at the well and of course waiting for God to instruct him, right? But when we read in the next verse, because this is the part of your single, what you should be listening to right now, okay? Watch what this man is going to do because he has no knowledge as to who is God's choice for Abraham's son, Isaac. He doesn't know this. So watch what he does. Watch what he does here uh, in verse 12. And he said, who is he? The eldest servant of the house of Abraham. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham. He's praying now. He's praying. I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Let's stop right there. So what is he really doing here? Is he going there and say, okay, now which one is the prettiest one? Is he saying, I wonder who, who, who daddy got the most camel and donkey and livestock and the most potato and yam? No, he did none of that. Because he wasn't going by wealth, because he wasn't going by outside cosmetic, super young people, I hope you're listening to me. He truly said, you know what? I've already made this oath. Let me let me let the same God that has led Abraham, this my master who I watch God work in his life. I watch God make him a wealthy man. I watch God advance him. I watch God help him out of the hands of his enemies. It is you, that same God I'm coming to, just how you directed my master Abraham. I am asking you to direct me to find his the wife for his son. I try to help you. Verse 13 of Genesis 24. Behold, I stand here by the well, he's still praying, of the water. And the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink. And I will give thy camel drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast. Listen, listen, listen. Because this is what I was trying to get to. He said, as, as confirmation. I mean, he's telling God now, God, this, will how, uh, this is how I will know that this is Isaac's wife. That when I go to the well and I ask her for a drink and she take the pitcher and lower it down to give me drink. Watch what he says then I will know this is the appointed. Right, man? We could drop up right here. We could pack up and go home right here. We could pack up and go home because all this doing is confirming what I was telling you from the beginning of this series. What I've been telling you from the beginning of the series, God has a plan for your life. And included in that plan is the person whom you're supposed to connect with in holy matrimony. The intent was you were supposed to marry the right person. And the only thing that's supposed to separate y'all two is death. You're all supposed to go through life together until death separates you. That's when you do it God way. 
like trying to help you. I wish someone to tell me that. I wish someone to straighten me out and not just tell me that, but break it down to me. I wish someone to tell me that. You all should be blessed to have someone like me. I ain't bragging on myself. You should be blessed to have someone like a Kevin Ewing who ain't going to be biased, who ain't going to be uh, trying to bring in all kind of doctrine. No, he he's using himself as an example who made the wrong choices in life. Mm -hmm. I try to help you to, I'm not here to condemn you. I need to tell you none of that. I came here on a mission to help you. I came to, I ain't your pastor who never sinned before. I, no, I ain't an outside children. I own all of my children. I don't know how them said go. I, I have, I, all my children I own. So I don't do that fool. But even with them who have outside children, none of us are perfect. Okay? All I trying to tell all of them, when you're condemning other people, could you please take out your iPhone or whatever and go into the notes section and now list off your evil? Because if you don't do that, you're saying you're perfect and they're evil. You've never sinned, but they did. You've done wrong in your life. Sorry, they've done wrong in their life, but you've never done wrong. No, 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 no. No, no. I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. So let's go back here now because this is just too juicy. <laughs> this is just too juicy. Okay, watch this now. So verse 14 again. He's, he's telling God now. He says, now God, while I don't have a, a, a picture of this lady or anything to identify her, I don't know where her birthmark is located or nothing. I can't say if she had a big birthmark here shaped like the a country of Canada, then I would know that. So I have nothing, God. I so he says, okay, God, let, let me, let me, let me, let me do this. When I go, when when the ladies come out in the evening to get water, right? Listen to me carefully, God, because this is how I can notice her, and this is how I can know you speaking to me that this is the one to get. When she come, I'm gonna ask her to for some water, and if she gives me some water and say some other stuff, watch what he says here. He says, then I will know. This is the one you appointed. So let's take it from verse 14 again, Genesis 24. He says, and let it come to pass that the damsel or the young lady to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher. Now the pitcher would be the thing she's carrying the water in. Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, okay, so this is how the conversation can be. Drink, and I will give thy camel drink also. So he says, if it happened that way, Lord, he says, let the same be she that thou hast appointed. I want you to stop right there. Stop right there. Stop right there. Appointed. Mm -hmm. I love that word. So watch this, right? Appointed, right? Listen to this. Uh, I looked up this word. I got it right here. And I, and I was trying to define it earlier. And it means to designate. It means to arrange, have something that was arranged or prearranged. It means to, to have something scheduled, ED, past then. So in, 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 in any event, the word appointed means something that was already, uh, preparations was already made in advance. So the servant is saying, God, if what I'm telling you to do for me to know that this is the wife for Isaac, then, sorry, if this is the appointed one, the one that you scheduled, the one that you had prearranged, the one that you had set aside, if this was the one, I can know if everything that I'm asking you to do come to pass, I don't need no second opinions. I know this one right here. But I love the way that the Bible uh, re reference. What he said, let me pull it back up here, verse 14 of uh, Genesis 24. I love how it is said here. He says, if all of that what I just said, if you allowed it to happen, excuse me, he says, let the same be, let the same lady who's doing this for me, giving me the water and giving the camels water, he says, let the same be she, she, still the woman, still Rebecca, that's her name, let it be she that thou hast appointed Appointed, appointed, ED, past tense, 
This is the one that you, before the foundation of the world, had put in place for Isaac. Let's go back to what I say now. Is she, did, did, remember what I told you in the beginning, I said, listen, if God have a plan for you, you can't go out there and pick anybody and expect the plan of God to be incorporated in your choice and your desires. Because your desires and your choices are limited based on your knowledge. You don't know everything based on what you could see. You don't see everything based on what you hear. You don't hear everything. But the all-knowing God who knows the end of all things from its beginning is saying, uh, incorporated in the, my plan for your life, if you're supposed to be married, I already have a wife for you. I already have a husband for you. So my understanding of what I, what I think is only common sense, I think our preachers, our apostles, our teachers, our mothers of the church and all of this other stuff, should be teaching us how. How do we access the plan of God for our lives? What route do we take? What should we do to achieve it? They tell us, they tell us, but this is what they tell us. They said, make sure you got a man who got a job. Make sure he have his own house or he could put you in a house. Make sure he did everything except what the word of God says. What the word of God says. Make sure he's wise. Make sure he's uh, prudent. Make sure he's diligent. Uh, make sure he is uh, faithful. And what's the next one again? Make sure he is uh, not prudent. I had it right here. Wise person, sorry, wise, good, uh, faithful, diligent, prudent. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for. When last you heard a sermon like that? When last you heard a sermon when they was preaching about marriage and they was preaching about who you're supposed to look for? When last did you hear them discuss these five points right here that the Bible made clear, which deals strictly with the heart now, strictly with the heart of this? When was the last time you heard that? Tell me when you heard a sermon preaching on who and what to marry, you heard any of that. I can tell you what you heard, though. I can tell now, 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 make sure now, oh, Lord, make sure, because you will not marry no broke man. So they're telling, like I can keep reiterating this, you're telling your daughters, don't worry about you, baby. You could have bad ways. You don't got to be no good woman. You don't got to be prudent. You don't have to be faithful. In fact, you don't go there, you don't do no self-introspection on you. Forget that. He is the one. All the responsibility is on his shoulder. He better be rich. He better have condominiums and houses all over the place and boats and cars and jet skis, motorbikes and the works. Because nowadays, from the secular world straight into the church, it is all about material things. It is all about a temporary pleasure. It is all about how it look on the outside and how others will look at us as the successful couple. To the next point, we do all kind of uh, TV interview, the Ewings, the this, the that. Nobody's looking for faithfulness. Nobody's looking for honesty. Nobody's looking for commitment. Nobody's looking for a diligent poison. Nobody's looking for a good poison. And if they're looking for a good poison, good according to their standards. He good because he just buy me rings and take me on cruise all over the world. That's why he's good. Have nothing to do with the sanctity of a union, according to God's standard. So like I've been reiterating, reiterating from the beginning of this, I ain't come here to condemn you. i coming back to take us to the beginning. Rather than preaching on who is a whore, who is an adulterer, who is an adulteress, who was married 400 times, rather than nailing it in their cerebral, rather than making them feel there's no hope, rather than making them feel like they're condemned already and they might as well just die and take a quick, quick ticket to hell, Rather than doing all of that, why don't you teach them what they should be looking for? Get out of here. I tired of them. They're frustrating. They're evil. They're evil because they preach from a selfish, angry, egotistical perspective, not from the compassion of Christ. They don't know what that is. They don't know how to perform that. And that's why I'm telling you, any church you go to now, you hardly see any young people there. They ain't coming there. Why they ain't coming there? They tired of being condemned. They tired of people telling them what they can wear and can't wear. They tired of telling people talking about weaving. They sick of it. They say those things among their friends. 
They will come to a place that the message and the word of God is so pure that by default I will change my ways. Not because you condemning me, I'm changing it. Because I'm going to be just like these hypocrites in here. Because you up on the pulpit and you could see me, I can dress the part according to what you like. But the minute I go home, I'm having sex with who I want to. I'm taking out my toys. I'm uh, masturbating. I'm having sex phone calls, watching pornography. And I'm quite fine with that because you don't see it. Mr. Only could see as far as what, I, what you could see over here. I'm trying to help you. Get away from these places. I keep telling you that they are grooming you for hell under the guise that they're doing everything right. No, you're doing seemingly what is right from the outside. The messages that they preach are messages of condemnation. You will never be better. What you're doing is trying to meet up to their standard. Jesus, when he went to the well, he never tried to make that woman come to his standard. He never condemned her. He never cemented her understanding. Five whole men you laid on with. You are the nastiest thing on legs. You are so filthy. And did he say that? Did he say you are a whore? I can't believe men will even come. You see, this is why you shouldn't be under those places. It gives you the wrong perception of the God that you serve. This is why I've seen so many people on YouTube make videos as to why they don't believe in Jesus no more. Now, firstly, when I used to hear them say that, I said, it's a fool. I listen to this fool. One time, I'll never forget it, this one black guy. I said, let me listen to him, see what he got to say. And everything that that man said resonated with me. I said, this man is so, mind you, I don't give him right. It's just that he didn't have a good foundation because if he had a good foundation, even though the place that he went to was teaching garbage and he came to realize it, he would have left the place but not leave God. Because that's what I did. I left the places, but I didn't leave my God because I know my God was what wasn't what they were preaching. So this is what I'm saying. A lot of young people in particular, they are tired. They are tired of these self-righteous people. They are tired of people telling them, okay, Papa, okay, you wear a full 16-piece suit because your great-granddaddy did that to preach. I don't want to preach. I want to preach in a jeans, pants, and a t-shirt, maybe a coat if I want to. I want to actually wear tennis with this jeans, pants, and preach the word of God. Oh, no, no, you need to jeans, pants. Oh, no, you need to put a whole cape on. They are tired, of, they're tired of you dictating to them. And the sad part is what you're dictating have nothing to do with the word of God, or at minimum, it has no effect with to do with their salvation. Zero. So that's why you see me dressed the way that I dress when I minister. I wear no suit. Very the last time I wear a suit when I was, this was probably in Texas a couple of years ago. That's it. I don't have to, I don't have to do these things to prove my love for my Christ. I'm not going to let nobody dictate to me and tell me how I should should perform. Did, didn't you make your decisions to do what you want to do? So who give you the right to tell me, especially if I have nothing to do with scripture? So this is why I'm saying to you, you've lost your zeal for Christ. You've lost your zeal for the word of God because you are tired of people acting as if they're perfect. You wear a weave, you're a whore. If you as a young man wearing your pants down there or a young woman come in the church and you could see all her panty line and so on, they quick to condemn her. They're quick to say, no, 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 I ain't no decent woman. You no, talk to her like a human. In fact, you know what's the best thing to do? Baby, this is your first time to this church? I tell you what, me and the sisters will come together. We will take you on a shopping spree. Yes. Oh, me? Me? But y'all don't even know me. We don't need to know you, baby. You are part of the body. And if you ain't saved yet, we hope you can be a part of the body one day. But until that day come, we can show you sisterly love. We ain't going to sit here and say, what kind of whore is coming here? And my husband looking at her panty line. You see, I tell you, I, I hope you are listening to me, you know. I get set off on these things because, again, this is what I hear just about every day in counseling. And I got to sit down and listen to this. I'm not angry with them, and I want to listen to it. But I, I feel the heart of the young people. They're frustrated. They're tired. Aside from their government and family and everybody else condemning them, they're coming to the spiritual hospital, which injecting them with black needles, which injecting them with poison. And what is this black needle and poison, Mr. Ewing? Condemnation. They could never get it right. If they don't meet the standard of the past and how he dress and what he does, then they could never be a child of God. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. So what they do? They say, well, ain't no hope here. Yeah? If God did really love me, they had somebody at that church talk to me. So what do they do now? They, in their frustration, in their, in, why are you think the young people are so angry? 
and the things that they're doing. This this is them reacting. Just like when when you when you come not on there so much, then they act out. So I feel sorry for them because the people who God has ordained to teach, to train, to 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 encourage, to show compassion to people. They got the big stick like they never did wrong, that like God never spared them, that God never hide them in their shame. No, forget what God do for me. God didn't do it for me. He, he look out for me, but I look out for you. I can beat you and I can let the world know how much of a whore you is and how much of an adultery you are and how much of a no good blah, blah, blah. No, boy, I will never, ever attend a church like that because it's not a church. It's a synagogue of devils. So I fully, fully, fully understand the young people. And I am with them 100% in terms of their frustration. Frustration. And the sad part about it, this is, no oh Lord, it all cost me get hot right now. The sad part about it, I could see you complaining and telling me what to wear and what not to do and all. I could see if what you were saying in the church, what I'm looking at, that you claim to be the point, for, and, and people were actually prospering. If I was actually seeing fruit, but I'm seeing the same people who sat under you for 4 million years, still sick with cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, their foot and toe and fingers cut off, their children lock up in jail or being slaughtered down in the streets. However, they don't wear wigs, they don't wear eyeliner, they don't wear tattoos and makeup, they don't wear earrings, they don't wear none of those things that you scream every day. But let's look at the quality of their lives. So Kevin, why are you saying all of this? What does this mean? I'm showing you why it becomes more convoluted for people to be directed to the one that God has called for them. That's what I'm trying to get to. There's so much man-made hurdles you have to jump. There's so much things that you heard so long that you don't realize this was keeping you away. That same guy over there, right over there, he isn't a Christian. He isn't a Christian. He believe in God. He could quote scriptures. He know that, but he say, you know, he ain't ready to get saved yet. Just like once, you wasn't ready. Now, mind you, like I always give this example, even though he's saved, who knows the end from the beginning? God, right? So if God says to you, you who save, and that man over there who isn't saved, that's the man I have for you. But you ain't going to listen to your mind or God telling you this. Why? Because this bully, this wretched human up here, this hypocrite who's preached perfection but lived none of it, is telling you, be equally yoked. And equally yoked mean that only they got to say is they are Christian. You don't need to see no fruit. You don't need to see no proof of it. And marry them. God say he's the one because he's the only Christian. You marry that one. Mind you, God says, no, this one over here. And you marry them. And what happened? All hell break loose. Why? Because that was not the, listen, listen, the appointed one for you. It was not the appointed one. It's not the appointed one. The problem here is you got to deal with it now. Now, people deal with it in many ways. Some stick it out and get beat down and kick out and be embarrassed and lose all hope and figure this their portion. Some pick up and leave and stay to themselves. Some pick up and leave and get married to other people. Now, it all depends on how you can wake it out. Because no matter how you wake it out, no matter how you wake it out, in their eyes, you're the devil. In their eyes, you're a demon. No matter how much God call you, no matter how much miracles you perform, no matter what it is you're doing in the will of God, and no matter how much of a pure heart you're doing it, because they are trained never to look at the heart, but to always judge you as the human, you will never be right or perfect in their sight. That's why I had to leave. I told you, I have to go. If I had a chance of fulfilling the will of God in my life and having access to the abundant life, I could not stay in those places anymore. Too traditional. And the sad part is I see nobody excelling, nobody going ahead, everybody going to an early grave and, and, and never, ever succeeding and then leaving children and grandchildren behind to take on the same exact cycle of never enjoying life, working out all your life. At the end of the day, you don't own nothing. They have to airlift you. Your children can't even come together. You ain't got no money. Your children ain't going to no, come together to send you away. You got to now go put up GoFundMe to raise money after 80 years of working, huh? after 70 years of going to church, after 60 years of flipping boat and, and swinging on the chandelier. Look what your God give you. Cancer, diabetes, you can't enjoy life, you can't travel, you, there's nothing you could do. Why? Because of tradition, even though he told you what the consequences of tradition will produce. Don't you play with me. 
So young people, I talking to you. I ain't got time for the rest of them. Who don't want to listen? I talking to you who are not married as yet. I trying to help you. Don't make the mistake I made and many others. It isn't that we don't love God. We're not perfect. We make mistakes like everybody else. But you know what? Like I told you, when I left the four walls, I never left my Jesus. And that's the message I'm trying to give to the young people. Yes, you're frustrated of what they're doing. Yes, you see the hypocrisy and the sweetheart and the side pieces they got in a place called the house of God. Yes, you see the wickedness and witchcraft. But don't let that be the determining factor for you to leave the true Jesus. Because his plan will never fade away. He still have the plan for you. So don't let that deter you. Continue seeking him. Continue praying to him. Continue asking him to guide you, to guide you to your, the, the one he has appointed for you. That's the one who you're interested in. Listen to these liars. Your time for them. So again, here in verse 14, he says that, Lord, if this woman do everything I'm asking you to do, then let the same woman, and that's what I love about the scripture, let the same be, verse 14, of Genesis 24, let the same be she that has, that thou, meaning God, has appointed, keyword, has scheduled. Remember I did a sermon called, uh, there's, a, there's a set time for deliverance. Excuse me. The Bible says in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, he said that God makes all things beautiful in this time. That's a good prayer point. Father, I want to be married. Father, I don't want to marry anybody. I'm listening not only to Kevin's messages, but people who are preaching in the same vein, the thing you had ordained before the foundation of the world. Father, let me encounter. Let me not be late for my set times in life. Father, let me not be absent for my set times in life. Father, let me not be delayed, set back, or hindered by human, environment, job, whoever. Father, always let me be on time for the set times you've appointed for my life. That's how you ought to be praying. That's how you ought to be praying. So he says, let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast shown me kindness unto my servant. Verse 15 of Genesis 24. And it came to pass before he had done speaking that behold, Rebekah came out who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Naor, Abraham's brother, with a pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel, meaning Rebecca, was very fair, very beautiful to look upon. A virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. Verse 18 of Genesis 24. And she, who is she? Rebecca. God's appointed for Isaac. And she said, drink, my Lord. And she hastened and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels. My Lord, you came to ask her for some water. And what did she do? Not only did she give you water, she gave the camels water. Hmm, she sound like a faithful person to me. She sound like a prudent person to me. She sound like a diligent person to me. She sound like a wise person to me. You see, these are the qualities. No matter where you go in this planet, if you see these qualities, the next thing you do now, Father, let this is this what is this the one for my life? I just won't be sure, God. God, I ain't nagging you. God, I know I seem like I's a little past right now, but hear me, God. I do not want to make the mistake, Kevin, and the rest me. I want to do it right the first time. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. My God. Verse 20 says, And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the throat, throw, 
and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for his camels. My God, you hear this? The man only asking for some water for him. She said, after she didn't satisfy water for him, she jumped down and ran to the well for more waters to give to the camels. Mighty God, my God. Mm -mm. My God. Boy, she was raised proper. That's what it is, because I know she wasn't raised by people. Now, make sure he got 600 camels now, and make sure he got a nice pinky onyx ring, and make sure he got some mud uh, flats Airbnb. No, none of that. <laughs> none of that. Verse 21, <laughs> verse 21 of Genesis 24, and the man wondering at her held his peace to with whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of the ten shekel weight, weight of gold and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethul, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Naor. She said moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge thee. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. Mighty God. I so really like reading that story. Why is he worshiping God here? Because God has answered his prayer. Mm -hmm. Y'all, y'all, I hope y'all, I don't have the time in this session to really break down in detail. And I one, and maybe before the series out, I'm just going to do a teaching from the time he encountered Rebecca to the time where she had invited him. And I, and I just want to strip it and show you the qualities of God appointed for this boy Isaac. Meaning that God didn't pick her because she was fair or she was pretty. We can break down how she was so hospitable, how kind she was, how inviting she was. All of these things embedded in this gift for this boy Isaac. This is what we overlook when we are trained in a society by our pastors, our religious leaders, our parents, our educators, everything is about material. If, if, if the poison don't come already packed with the stuff that you require, they are not of God as far as you're concerned. The biggest mistake you could ever make in this life. The biggest mistake. The biggest. Why? Because if you're looking for stuff like faithful, Proverbs 28, verse 20, a faithful man, one who is committed, one who is going to stick it out to the end, even when you're sick, even when you're, you're on your way out, no matter here, getting all sexually frustrated and figgy, got to go release herself somewhere out, somewhere else, because it ain't his fault you ain't in the position to handle him. No. This is my wife. I made a commitment. I love her. She has the characteristics such as prudence, such as diligence, such as wisdom. She's a good woman. She is a faithful woman. She's a loyal woman. I got to stick with this because when I was down on when she met me and I didn't have a job, she took a chance on me. It showed me how faithful she was. It showed me it wasn't about material things with her. It showed me that this is someone I could build a life with. Trying to help you. Trying to help you. The devil gonna send them with all kind of stuff to razzle and dazzle you and never show you who pulling the strings behind their back. What strings are you talking about, Ewing? The strings of lust. The strings of unfaithfulness. The strings of bringing outside children to the house. The strings of disrespect. The strings of beating and punching you up. Those strings I'm talking about. That you don't see because you see the bling bling in the car and the house and they work in the bank or there's a doctor, Indian chief lawyer. I trying to help you. Listen to me, young people. Don't listen to these set trying to discourage you. I trying to help you. 
I try to help you make the right choices in life when it comes to a lifelong partner and what you ought to be looking for. Something that will sustain. You need, see, the faithful wife, the committed wife, the loyal wife, this is also for the husband, the one that who's prudent, the one who is wise, the one who, 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 who is good to you. These become the nuts and bolts for this union to weather the storms that not might come, but what will come. Mm -hmm. These are the nuts and bolts that no matter what you do or each other do, no matter how mad you are, no matter how much you want to speak to each other and how much you probably wish you could sleep on one side of the house and they sleep on the next side, even though you're doing these devastating things, I'm not leaving. I'm not going nowhere. Even while you in the next room with your mouth poke off, the truth is I wish I was in there with him. I wish I could put out my pride and go in there and hug her up. This is what commitment does. This is what people who truly love from the heart, not from the externals. Because when the car get mashed up, when the bank take the car, when the repossession come, when true losses come in life, which your so-called love was attached to. So what you think happened to the love when those things go? You go. Because there's no commitment. And that is what we lack, commitment. Everybody, I wouldn't say everybody, yes, but everybody, nowadays, their, their self-worth has nothing to do with respect anymore, has nothing to do with commitment, has nothing to do with loyalty, has nothing to do with those things. Their self-worth is money. Oh, I'm worth 2.3 million. Oh, I'm worth, oh, I, I own those two properties over there. I own, see, to them, that's their value. So they're superficial. That's what, if you're smart, if you're listening to me, they're really talking on themselves. They say, hey, you could get involved with me, but let me be clear with you right now. I am extremely superficial. Everything about me is, is about cosmetics, all right? And trust me, the day these cosmetics go, or, or especially on you, you go on too. So let's just be clear. Now, I can wine and dine you until that day come. And even if that day don't come, if I meet someone that is prettier than you, someone who have a better shape than you, I gone. You know why? Because what I have here with you have nothing to do with love. It have everything to do with lust. In other words, what I'm saying to you, I am, this is the part I wanted to get to, I am an habitual adulterer. For those of you coming on late and I made that statement, I know you shock as hell, but don't be shocked, mate. Go back to the beginning of the same recording right there because that's why I defined it. I gave you a little taste of what that word adultery meant earlier. So the man who you are about to marry that is not God's appointed for your life, the woman that you are about to marry that is not God's appointed for your life, who have this uncontrollable, lustful, sexually perverted mindset, you're marrying an adulterer, but Kevin, they were never married before. I know. They were never. So how you can call him an adulterer? He, the one who they married was never married before. How can you call him adulterer? Well, let's see what the rules say that your preachers don't tell you. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 12, 27 to Matthew 5, verses 27 to 28, he said, in time past, you were told that thou shalt not commit adultery, but I am saying to you, whosoever, anybody, anyone, whether you're married or you ain't married, anyone that looketh upon a woman or a man or whoever and lusts after them, they've committed adultery already in their heart. So let me qualify my statement for you. So you're marrying this guy who can't keep his eyes off of other women. But he was never married before. It don't matter. Because according to Jesus' rules, he was an adulterer from the heart, from day one. He'd been cheating on you from his heart. Now, why is Jesus saying that? Well, let's go back to the rest of the rules he said. He says, out of the abundance of the heart, because once it's in the heart now, it's only a matter of time before I make this thing manifest into a physical act. So that's why he said it's not only he that literally have sex with a married person is an adulterer, but the one who is lusting after something that don't belong to them lawfully, or even, sorry, lawfully meaning that this isn't their wife or their spouse, but outside of that, you're an adulterer. Now, you aren't married as yet. And you even telling your friends, Shia Hang like, he's a nice man. Nice man, meaning he's bringing Chinese lunch and so on for lunchtime, Chinese food and throw some, you know, teriyaki and stuff. She, she liked that. And, you know, every, so she come with the roses, right? 
that is side piece who we break up with, send him roses. So he take these roses and she don't even give it to her. She didn't know this. She didn't know this. And he just looking at everything. They're on the stoplight. She talking about her day at work. And the lady passing, winding her hip. And he just like that. And she hit him. Why you, you don't have no respect for me? Come on, what's wrong with you? And I wasn't looking at no one. He's an adulterer. He, oh, did you hear the pastor preach that? No, he ain't gonna preach that. That ain't juicy enough to call you whores and adulterer. That ain't juicy enough for him. <laughs> we ain't gonna go there. So I'm showing you, young people who are not married as yet, <laughs> these are the things that you ought to be looking for. What I, I call them qualities that will sustain the storms of any marriage. Wisdom, or a wise person, a good person, a faithful person, a diligent person, a prudent person. The Bible says a prudent wife cometh only from, only, only from the Lord, only God could give you a prudent wife. God gave Isaac a prudent wife. Prudent, because it could only come from him. A prudent man only could come from God. You, you can't go online and order him. You can't go to Amazon or eBay and put in a bid for him like they do in the churches. See, in the churches, you could put in a bid for a man. You could actually bid for a human. You could literally, I've been in those services, you can actually, you they they stake a price. Now, you want to, what kind of man you want? You, you want two eyes, so you want one eye, what, you, you got full 20-20, because it, it all depends, the bidding can change on you. You want two foot? Now, don't mess around, but you want lawyer, because we up in the thousands now. We're talking 15 over. This is the house of God. Well, you could bid for man now. <laughs> Boy, I tell you. I try and help you all, yeah? <laughs> I try and help you. So you see in this story, we see where God has an appointed person for you. He has someone that was scheduled for you to connect with at a certain time in life. These connections, these scheduling, these appointments is called, according to biblical law, uh, the law of time and season is also called, also called the law of temporary, which you will find in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's a time to hate. There's a time to love. There's a time to embrace. There's a time to push back. There's a time to live. There's a time to die. So the way that God has set up uh, the world, nothing lasts forever in this temporary world. Everything is on a scheduled time. That's why I said to you, I was giving you this nugget. I say, when you pray, right? Pray that God, I always arrive on time to my schedule appointments. And schedule appointments simply means that God had have a plan for your life. For you who are not married, Father, I hope I didn't miss my appointed time. But if I did, Lord, could you please revisit me to my appointed time? Could you please restore me when I allow the devil to dupe me out of the time you had scheduled specific for me? Just like how you had the time appointed and scheduled for most, for Abraham and his servant to now make an agreement to ensure that Isaac get the wife that God has scheduled for him. Pray it over your children. I, I pray this over my children, my son, my daughters. I pray it. I say, Father God, don't let them. Don't let my babies make the mistake I made. Don't let them. Lord, let them come into the same wisdom that I'm telling these people here now. Father, I pray that the, the, the wife for my son, the, the husbands for my daughters, Father God, just like how you're grooming my daughters and son for them, likewise groom them for my daughters and son. Father, I pray that my children will not be late at their schedule, appointed time to meet their mates. I try to help you. I try to help you. Father, you got to do this for me. You know why? Here's what your word says. Your word says, according to Psalms 112, verses 1 to 2. Blessed is the man, there's a qualifier. Blessed is, praise the Lord. Blessed is the man that feared the Lord, who reverence God. 
Blessed is the man that feared the Lord and delighted greatly in his commandments. That's me. I fear the Lord and I delighted greatly in his commandments. I didn't say I am perfect. I didn't say I am sinless. I said none of that. I am saying what the scripture says. Blessed, praise ye the Lord. Psalms 112 verses 1 to 2. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feared the Lord and delighted greatly in his commandments. What's going to happen now? As a result of him following that protocol, his seed, his children, what will be for them, shall be mighty upon the earth. Wow. My children, my son, my daughters shall be mighty upon the earth. They shall meet their schedule appointments with everything that God had ordained for them before the foundation of the world. Father, I thank you I got the knowledge. Father, I thank you that you're using me to give the knowledge so your people will know what to pray for. Your people, rather than condemning their children like their foolish pastors has encouraged them to do, shut that foolishness down right now. My child shall be the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. That's how you talk. That's how you talk. Two weeks ago, I'd send my son a, a WhatsApp, and every now and again, I would do this, right? Same thing I would do if I'm talking to my daughters, and I would say, I said to my son how proud I am of uh, his life, how he decided to play by the rules, and very successful, got a super career, doing very, very well. And I said to him that his success uh, is evidence to me that I felt I did a good job and, and raising him. So he said to me, and it really, really did. So he's, he's, he's 27 years old. He's going to be 28 in April. He said to me, he said, he said, Daddy, first of all, I thank you for guiding me on the right path and you know, teach me how to save and budget and all these other stuff and putting me through school. He went through all of that. He said, but there's one thing. This was his words to me. I ain't going to lie to you. I, I almost cried just listening. He said, if there's one thing that I will never forget among many other things. Because up until he was like four years old, he lived with his mother. Then he came to live with me from five years until he went off to school. He said, it was one thing that I'll never forget. He said, remember when I would come by you to spend time and mommy would drop me there. And every Sunday before I leave, you would sit in the bed, bring me between your legs with the olive oil, and you would touch me and do my hand. And he said, I'll never forget this. You would always say, Father, let KJ be the head and not the tail. Let him be above only and not beneath. And he said, when I think about that and where I am right now, I know it only could be because of God. And he said, I want to thank you for that. Now, I don't want to cry in front of this boy, right? So I'd hurt get him off the phone, right? <laughs> but what that did for me, and I share my stories. I'm very candid. I'm very open. I'm very transparent because I want you to know I ain't no fake. I am a realist. I mess up in life royally, as well as I did some stuff to make up for the mess that I made. It is important how you treat or demonstrate to your children, because they're watching you whether you realize it or not. And just like how I could have said those things and that boy could remember it, it's the same thing when you tell them they will never be nothing. You curse them out. They will never marry the right people. They'll be a whore all their lives and rain on the bastards. The same way my son remembered the good, if I was one to talk nonsense, he would have remembered the bad also. So I'm trying to share with you, especially you, you young people. Listen to me and listen to me well. Even if you have a child or a wedlock right now, don't let nobody condemn you. The mere fact that you are living right now, God is not done with you and the plan is still on schedule. The only thing you need to be interested in, like I'm telling you right now, Father God, help me to meet the appointments because you messing up in life does not stop what is already scheduled. You know when the scheduling come to an end? When you are dead. So because you are not deceased, God's plan is still in effect. Don't listen to these preachers telling you otherwise. Don't listen to your parents or anybody telling you foolishness what you done mess up your life because you are a child or whatever the case may be. Foolishness. If you have HIV right now, the mere fact that you are alive, kicking and well, the plan is still in place and God is waiting you to meet your schedule appointments. I try to help you. I try to help you. So we're going to con conclude with this, this last story. All right. 
Now we see in this particular case where God, excuse me, reveal his original plan in terms of a spouse, excuse me, for, for Isaac Abraham's son. But it began with others having an idea that God does have a plan for all of us. And Abraham knew that because if God made a covenant that will secure the future generations. God says, Abraham, that through you, all families of the world, not some, all families of, not just the Israelites and, and the Hebrew people, all families of the world should be blessed. So if that's the case of God is putting all of these plans in place. So all of these saying, making all of these grand statements and promises, then there has to be a blueprint. There has to be a plan to get there. So with that said, you have to, as a child of God, to tap into this plan, you must tap into the laws, the rules, and the principles of God. That's key. And if anyone is preaching otherwise, stop listening to them. Well, and if you don't believe me, look at those they've been preaching to for years. Even right down to your mother and your father. And guess what? And mommy mean well. But mommy feel by telling you the worst side of things, always telling you what bad could happen and this and that, Somehow she feels she's encouraging you to stay away from that. And I don't know when parents are going to get it. When you keep telling a child to stay away from something, that makes it more interesting to them. So what should you should be what should you be doing? Let me tell them the rules to get here. Let me child, if you do this, just like when I told my son, care if you save your money. Don't mind your friends balling. Remember, this is the early stages of your life, and this is going to determine the latter part of your life. What you do now is going to have a great effect on you up the road. And I would sing this to him. I say, learn to put something aside. And I trust, I say, trust me, Kev, the more you put aside, give it a year or two. When you look at how much money you put aside, how disciplined you was, it's going to encourage you to do more. Didn't he do it? Didn't, 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 isn't he living it today? So you stop telling him the worst what could happen this, could, this year. If you do this, boy, God can reward you here. And, and, and not only that, I think the greatest testimony for him, and I just thank God how he had it orchestrated for my son to live with me straight through his childhood, straight up to going off to school, because he get to see what this old man went through. The greatest testimony, and I think that's why he really listened to me, because he sees fruit in his father's life. He saw when his father lost it all, he was right there to witness it. He was right there to witness his father in his lowest moments. He witnessed it. But guess what he always saw and what he always heard? He always saw his father's commitment to God. He saw his father praying. He saw his father preaching. He saw his father when his father was going through the voice, get up on a pulpit and encourage other people. His father didn't take his anger. His father didn't take his disappointment and condemn people and talk down to people and say, women ain't no good and this one is a whore and this one is an adulterer. He didn't see that. So what did that do for him without his father even teaching him that, but just by him observing? He has a better perspective of life. That's what he have. He, 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 what, he ha what he saw was creating in him how to be resilient when the forces of life come at you and where to go to get it fixed. He heard his father crying out to God in the room. He heard his father praying for him. So that's why for me, if I die right now, I have nothing to worry about because he saw, he saw when he get in his problems, when life throw bad apples at him, you don't cuss, row, go fight, go work witchcraft. Get on your knees like you saw your daddy did. And you cry like you saw your, you, you, you're still a man. You're still a man. Don't listen to this mess. But if you cry, you're no man. You cry to the God of Abraham. And just how he see his daddy life turn around. Just how he saw his daddy got caught up, catapulted by the, the invisible God that his father was praying to. He watched the same invisible God turn it around for his father. He watched the same invisible God give his father a new lease on life. He watched the same invisible God provide the funds to put him through school. When he saw before, daddy barely had money to give me for lunch. I'm trying to help you, young people. I ain't talking to the older one. They're the judges. 
I ain't talking to the ones who go to the church where you can't pitch your pants and you can't wear. I see they ain't listen to me. I talking to you. I talking to you, young people who ain't married yet. I talking to you, young people who don't have baby or the wedlock. I talking to you, young people who don't and cut and condemn and cut you off and say you'll never be nothing in life. They're all liars. They are all liars. So the same father who would go with him on the beach, be sitting in the car and talk. And he would say, Daddy, when things are going to change? And I say, son, so on, don't worry about it. Trust in God. When the truth is, I didn't know when it was going to happen. When the truth is, I had my doubts that it will even happen. The conversation changed today. So when we talk now, I hear, boy, Daddy, I remember. I remember when we couldn't do this. I remember when things were so hard. Look at God today. Now, when I talk to him, he tell me, Daddy, I just come off my fast. Daddy, I just finished praying for this. Daddy, I just, see, sometimes teaching somebody isn't sitting them down and dictating, you know. They're watching your actions. That's why I say to you, don't listen to these people condemning, you know. They live one life up there or one life in front of people and they treat their family, their wives and everybody like dogs and hogs because they have everybody else intimidated to their church, not here. It ain't going to happen here. Okay, so let's look at our last story and let's go to Jeremiah chapter 16 Jeremiah chapter 16 this is going to be powerful and like I said in the first story we saw we saw we saw where there's a where God has chosen someone for for you to marry and in this story this is a beautiful story we're going to see where because there is an appointed poison for you Trust me, God is going to tell you whether he said it to you audibly, whether he said it to you through a prophecy, whether you just open the Bible and you read something that's speaking directly to your situation. God is trying to communicate to you. So watch this now. Jeremiah chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. The word of the Lord came also unto me, this is Jeremiah, saying, listen carefully what God instructions is to this man, because I'm going to show you and prove to you once again. Because there's a plan for your life, inclusive of that plan is the person God has already ordained for you to marry. You don't have to marry them. Let me be clear here. But he has someone for you. Because that is in place, then there's a plan for it. That, that, I mean, you can't marry anybody. I don't care what the preachers tell you. If the preachers say everybody, all the women here are Christians and you as a Christian, Brother Kevin, well, guess what? You can marry anybody. God is going to approve that. Well, he might honor the covenant, but that don't mean he agree with it. So watch, watch what he's going to tell his servant, Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, Jeremiah 16, verse 1, Thou shall not, circle that, thou shall not take thee a wife, neither shall thou have sons and daughters in this place. Mm -mm, let, me, let me sit up here. Well, let me sit up, because I'm fit, right, to, to really let you all have this. <laughs> this here could be juicy. The God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, if he didn't have a plan, then it shouldn't matter who you marry. It shouldn't matter if there was not a specific person for you, then you could marry whoever you choose. You could do whatever you want to do when it comes to holy matrimony. So why is God specifically telling his servant, this place where you is, don't look at none of them. Don't, don't, don't marry them. Don't have no children with them. Boy, some people listen to me right now. Lord, I wish God to talk to me playing like that. All the hell I catch you with these children I had for this no good man. Mm. I'm trying to help you. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm changing all I'm giving you is scripture. God said to Jeremiah, Thou shall not, verse 2 of Jeremiah 16, Thou shall not take thee a wife, neither shall thou have sons or daughters in this place. Now, why is he saying this? Because he knows the end from the beginning. Because he's the Alpha and Omega. Because he's the all-knowing God. And because he knows, he knows just what he's talking about. While you're looking at her and see how fine she is, and all her siblings are doctors and lawyers, and all of them got big mansions, God says, okay, now let's put that aside. 
Now look up the road a little bit further, right? Look at you up the road, stress rate out, losing so much weight, the children don't respect you, her family turn on you, they come into con 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 collusion to work against you. You didn't see that part because you were so busy looking at the aesthetics, looking at all of the outward appearance. But God who is all knowing, and I know this message is resonating to someone right now who is contemplating taking the next step with that person. Ask God, God, is this person for me? Father, I, I, I surrender. I, I stop leading on my own understanding. Show me in a vision. Confirm it in a prophecy. Show it to me in the Bible. Let me hear it some way, somehow. This is not the way forward. Or if it is, make it clear to me. So he says, thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. For thus said the Lord concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place. Now he's talking about Israel. This is Israel he's talking about. That's like God saying to you right now, this you go to the, uh, the first Baptist church on the hill and God saying to you, don't marry no woman in this church. Oh, 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 I know you're going to listen to him because you figure this church and everybody in saved and all them living right. Yeah? Because he's about to explain why. And his explanation of why is only more evidence of the all-knowing God who knows the end from the beginning. And because he knows my end from the beginning of my life, who better to take advice from? Him. So watch this. He says here from 3. In verse 3 of Jeremiah 16, For thus said the Lord concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place, and concerning their mothers that bear them, and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. Verse 4 of Jeremiah 16, They shall die of grievous deaths. Mm -mm. Sound like generational curses to me. God says, don't get involved with that family. They look nice on the outside. They appear to be decent. Don't fool up with them. You're marrying into a curse. You're marrying into death and tragedy and turmoil. No peace, no contentment. You can't see it now. In fact, the devil have it set up that way to lure you in. But I, God, who know the end from the beginning, do not marry these people. Don't get involved with these people. So he says in verse 4, they shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented. Don't cry over them. Why, God? God, I think that's kind of cold. You're telling me they're going to die of brutal gunshot wounds, stabbing, murder, car rolling over them, dying and in, in plane crash would ob obliterate them. And you're telling me don't lament, meaning don't grieve, don't cry, don't show compassion. Now, hold on now. What kind of God you are? Keep reading. Keep reading. Because he knows the end from the beginning. Verse 4 says, They shall die of grievous death. They shall not be lamented. Neither shall they be buried. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, okay. I understand if they get shot down, don't cry for them. You, you might have your reasons. But don't bury them. What could they have done? What kind of people are these people? That the God Almighty who created them is telling you don't cry for them. God Almighty who created them, they don't even bury them. They even waited. It's how no good they are but they didn't look that way on the outside. And the way that you found out, you better marry them first. When the all-knowing God was telling you, son, do not take this route. Do not take this route. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried, but they shall be as dung. You know what dung is? Doo-doo, poo, feces. What could these people have done? <laughs> he say, he say, but they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth, and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine, poverty, and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. What could these people have done? Verse 5 of Jeremiah 16. For thus said the Lord, Enter not into the house of mourning. Meaning when they die, you don't even go over there. Enter not into the house of mourning. Neither go to lament, nor bemoan them. Don't cry over them. For I have taken away my peace from this people. Oh, Lord, let me, let me, Jesus is getting too hot. You all hear that? 
you trying to figure out this man who you married. You never had a day's peace from the time you say I do. This woman you marry, you can't even spell the word peace. Her family wretched. She wretched. Her brother's wretched. Her third and fourth cousin wretched. Her mommy wretched. Everybody wretched. This man you marry, he complained, but everything, he cheap, wretched, spiteful, vindictive. Mm. I wonder if God took his peace from them. But he didn't have to tell you that because he told you from day one, do not marry these people. I've had people prophesy to you. I came to you in a dream. I spoke to you in your spirit. I spoke to you in the songs you listen to. Do not marry them. I've already removed my peace. These people are sold to the devil. These people are consciousness. These people are hateful. You, you cannot see that. Did you look at what I told you to look for? Did you look for a wise man or woman? Did you look for a good man or woman? Did you look for a diligent man or woman? Did you look for a prudent man or woman? A committed man or woman? A loyal man or woman? Did you know? What did you look for? You look for externals. But even then, I knew your vision and understanding would be limited. So I spoke to you and I said to you, do not marry them. I didn't have to tell you I took my peace from them. I didn't have to tell you that they were verse, that they were cursed. All you had to do was listen to me. You didn't listen to me. So what happened? You activated some laws. And what are these laws? Proverbs 13 verse 18. Poverty and shame shall be to those that refuse instruction. Proverbs uh, 15 verse 32, I think it is. It says, Whoso refused instruction hated his own soul. The scriptures are now coming alive in your life because you went against the laws of God. She's cheating and sleeping on you, sleeping with other people on you and having babies on you. But didn't I tell you this was a part of the curse? Didn't I tell you in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15, a part of the curses that you will receive when you not when you don't listen to my instructions? I said you would be married to other to women to, to a wife, and other men will sleep with her. I told you, don't connect with them, don't have no covenant with them, don't marry them, right? So you went now and marry them. You start building house, invest all your money, you lose everything. Now other people living in the house, you've been trying to build for 300 years now. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I pre-warn you? Didn't I tell you these are the curses that would erupt from your disobedience? Did I not tell you this? Did I not tell you this? Didn't I tell you in Proverbs 4 verse 13, I said to you, grab fast hold of instructions. Keep her, don't let her go, for she is thy life. You didn't listen to me. You didn't listen to me. You didn't listen to me. You went around just like your crazy pastor and your crazy religious leaders condemning every everybody from the pulpit, right? Not knowing that up the road, you could be in the very position he's condemning him, condemning right now. What you can do then? You tell everybody that they divorce and they this and they that. And guess what? Times, the hand of time switch. And you found yourself in this position that you never planned to, just like other people. I try to help you. I'm trying to help you. Let's finish read. Verse 5 again of Jeremiah 16. For thus said the Lord, enter not into the house of the morning, neither go to lament nor bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people, saith the Lord, even loving kindness and mercies. So God is saying he's taken away loving kindness, mercies, and peace. They are heartless people. They'll cheat on you and feel no big deal. They'll probably bring the fellow, the woman, radio knows enough sex with them while you're in the next room. They, they have a demon heart. They, they have a reprobate mind. They don't know what it is to be, uh, to show pity or compassion because of God saying he's taking his peace, he's taking his mercies, and he's taking his loving kindness. So what what, what is what is governing their life? What, what is the, the moral? They have no moral compass for their life. Verse 6, he says, both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, nor cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. Verse 7 of uh, Jeremiah 16, neither shall men tear themselves for them in mourning to comfort them for the dead. Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their fathers 
or for their mothers. Verse 8, thou shall not also go into the house of the feasting, meaning that when the joyful time comes, don't go there and eat either, to sit with them to eat or to drink. For thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will cause to cease out to cease out of this place in your eyes and in your days the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. God is saying that this people at that time, which I believe was Israel, they are so cursed. He is going to cease out of the land. The word cease them mean to bring to a stop all marriages. I think Tiffany, Tiffany Montgomery, my good friend, she did in her teaching on the year of the bride, she was speaking a lot about this scripture here too. And she's talking about when a land is blessed and when marriages begins to reinstate, all of this is evidence of a blessing. But we're seeing here even the opposite to that. So the Bible is, is warning us, let's go back to the beginning, where God started verse 2 and said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, listen to me very well, do not take any one of these women to wife, don't marry none of them, okay? Now you may say, well, God, I ain't gonna marry them, but I, as a man, I need to get something on the side. So God come back even before he get that thought. He said, don't have no children with them. Don't sleep with them, don't fool with these people. And God began to give a laundry list to don't uh, mourn for them, don't cry for them, don't when their children get shoot down or they die themselves, don't go to their house, don't celebrate with them, don't do nothing with them, none of the above. And God says, "Why well, I've taken, I've withdrawn my peace, I have withdrawn, withdraw my loving kindness, I've withdrawn my mercy, even when I'm going to come to people coming together and being joined and holy, I, I have shut all of that down." Again, Kevin, why are you telling us about these things? I'm telling you because, again, I've been reiterating this from the beginning. We live in a superficial world. We live in a materialistic world. The average woman today, unfortunately, the average woman today considers it a sin if they meet a man in life who they like, who they see good quality is in, who they see have a heart to really do the right things in life. And they've, they, they, the guy has demonstrated this unknowingly, because this is who he is, from a distance, meaning that she's been watching him all along. She watched on the job how many girls try to come on to him and try to seduce him, and he dismissed them, he ignored them. She see how focused this man is in real life, how committed he is. But in her mind, she cannot go against the status quo because the status quo that has been drilled into her cerebral cortex by her church by her mother, by her brothers, by her friends. He have to have a job. He have to at least have a house of his own apartment. If he living with his ma, you don't want to fool up with that. All of these things that have nothing to do with the scripture. Again, for clarification's sake, am I saying go there and seek a man who don't have a job? I'm not saying that. As well as I saying don't dismiss one who may not have a job. Look beyond not having a job. Look beyond those qualities that I've been reiterating to you over and over. See, because if you don't get past this superficial part of your life that is very difficult to scrub away because it is so indoctrinated into our society, I'm telling you, you may not really realize it. You are a future potential candidate for divorce. It's going to happen. Because when life don't pan out what you thought it should have been, frustration is the next method of the divorce cycle. And once this frustration comes, you're going to abandon what you have here. Again, let's go back, and this is why you shouldn't condemn nobody. People who divorce, they didn't sit back as a child or in high school or primary school or wherever on career day and say, what, what you want to do for a living? What you, what, what's your career? What you want to do in life? Mm, let me see. I want to go to school. I want to get education. Mm, get a job. I want to get married. I want to get a divorce. I don't want to divorce one, two. I want at least three divorces under my belt. I want three divorces. I want to make sure I would have had three wives or three husbands. And, you know, maybe maybe get about 40 or 50 and settle down a little bit. I want to marry again because I want to leave this earth covering at least six to seven divorces. Nobody plans that. This is why if you catch them on one day weeping, they're crying because they feel hopeless. They mess up their life. They feel that they cannot keep a wife, keep a husband. So this is why I'm saying to you people, don't be like these misinformed people. Unfortunately, they are anointed in some areas. Unfortunately, though, they're taking the anointing to condemn, to be down. When Jesus Christ himself said, he, Jesus now, this is the one who said the rules. He says, listen, I did not come 
to the world, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Romans 8 verse 1, let there now therefore be no condemnation. What is the qualifier? For those who are in Christ Jesus. So if you're in Christ Jesus, who? The Bible says, who or what shall separate you from the love of God? Who? So this is why, again, I, I, I cannot get past this. I can't see how a so-called man or woman of God preaching from a pulpit on a specific sin, no matter what it is, and just condemning and as if there is absolutely no hope. But these same hypocrite people, they'll take your money. So it shows you they have no standard. If they truly believe what they said and all of these things that they call you, weave, wearing, adulterous, whoremonger, whatever, how is it that when it's time for the offering, they didn't say from the pulpit, now all the whoremongers and all the adulterers and fornicators and all the breakers of God commandments, do not put a dollar in that offering pan. They ain't going to do it because if they want to be honest, the Bible is very clear. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, there is no righteous man upon this earth that sinneth not. The Bible says a just righteous or a, a upright man fall it seven times and get right back up again. So all throughout the Bible, God is not endorsing your sin. God is saying, don't hang out there. I have made provisions for you to confess and move on. Be sincere and let's go. Like, come, give me your hand. Why you keep pulling back and listening to this man? Please give me your hand. I said to you, if you confess your sin, I, God, am faithful and just to not only forgive you of this sin that you think is so egregious. He says, but I'm going to put in a bonus. I am going to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Meaning that all the crevices where that sin was that you didn't even know was there, I can scrub all it out for you. All I want you to do, please give me your hand. Let's continue our journey. You can't do it because your commitment is to the leader. Oh God, I know you forgive me, Jesus. But Lord, God, you hear what he says? He say, if long as I'm married to this woman, I am said, oh God, oh Jesus, I know you forgive me, Jesus. But oh Lord, oh pastor, why? Why? So you see what I'm saying to you? And again, we can get deep when I get into my teachings to take you even deeper and deeper into these things. But I'm saying to you, God, the God of all mercy, the God of all loving kindness, God is not out there to see who's the best Christian or who was the worst sinner, all right? This same God said to you, I, he said to Moses, I will show mercy on whom I choose to show mercy. How many men and women of the Bible that were, that were, were, were destined for destruction, they were deserving of it. And this God who got all these rules for whatever reason that they violated, he pulled back, okay, not this one right here. Let's be going too far. Let's leave the Old Testament. Let's come to you. Let's come right there to you. How many things that you have done, maybe on your husband, maybe on your wife, how many things you'd have done to uh, your sibling that they don't know how this evil thing you did. You're still walking around with it, probably even guilty. God never exposed you. God never came into your sleep one night after you slept with your sister's husband that she don't know about. God never came to you in your dream in the night. Hello, I'm God. You know you are a whore, right? Hmm? You know, use the nastiest thing on two legs, right? How dare you? Did he do that to you? Why are you encouraging your leaders to call people whores if they're wearing weave, or if they're wearing jewelry, or if they're wearing whatever? Why? Are these the attributes or the pattern that God put in place for us, the leaders, to, to, to do to you? So, okay, if that's the case, then show it to me. Show me in the Bible where Jesus condemned the sinners, where Jesus called them all these names, and Jesus spoke of this perfection, perfectionist way of living. Show it to me. I just want to see it just once. So God is telling him in these two stories, in the story of Jeremiah and in the story of uh, Abraham's son Isaac, there is a plan for all of our lives. If you listen to the instructions and put God as the center, in fact, if you implement the rules uh, of uh, Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6, where you trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and all your ways acknowledge him, such as the eldest servant of Abraham's uh, house did, then he got the God kind of results. Okay, we have a different scenario over here with uh, Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah clearly wasn't married as yet. So I'm sure, even though he was doing the will of God, I'm sure he wanted to be married one day. I'm sure he was like, okay, well, uh, I don't know. I'm sure he had thoughts of marriage, 
marriage. So God intervened, like, okay, where are you going to be married later or not? I can tell you one thing, you will be making a mistake if you marry anybody from this group right here. So again, I'm proving my point. Not because you are a man and you want to be married or a woman who want to be married, you can marry anybody. You can because you have free will but it wouldn't be the wise thing to do. The wisest thing to do is seek the one who have created your help meet. He knows, he knows everything about you and say to him, now I can tell you one of the things he can tell you though, before he even leads you there, he can say, okay, these are the qualities that you are to be looking for, but let me be clear here, make sure these qualities are in you first. So when you come off of this life, and then you can say, now nah, you hear, hear what brother Kevin say, right? Kevin say, Kevin say, they got to be prudent. They got to be good. They got to be wise. They got to be diligent. They got to be faithful. And they got to be prudent. Now you better have that, sir. You better have that, ma'am. No, 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 no. Now when you point, man, I'll come right back here. Because you should have it initially if you're in search of it. That's what you, you, you cannot be looking for all of these qualities and you have absolutely none in you. That is the true definition of being unequally yoked right now. If you were looking for the true definition, that's it right now. Have nothing to do with being safe. Plenty of people you know just as well as I do who are safe, who are dishonest, who are liars, who are fornicators, who have sexual problems, pornography. So don't tell me being safe is the only uh, requirement for being, being equally yoked. Equally yoked is those same qualities that I would have shown you, right? So let's go now to 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to go a little bit deeper now. 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're about to bring all these things together, right? 1 Samuel chapter 16. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul heard it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with, with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 3 of 1 Samuel 16. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint him, thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spoke and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? Verse 5 of 1 Samuel 16. And he which is Samuel said, Peaceably I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified, sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. Verse 6 of 1 Samuel 16. And it came to pass when they were come that he, which is Samuel, the prophet, looked on Eliab, I think it is, and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. So he's looking at Jesse's first son. And he says, this is him right here. Surely this is the Lord. This is the one God sent me here to anoint to be king. So this is him now. Watch this now. Verse 7 says, but the Lord said unto Samuel, hallelujah, look not on his countenance. His countenance would be his facial expression. Look not on his countenance or on the height of his statue. Stature. So God, this is a principle. So God is saying to you, in your search of a mate or anything in life, don't look at the outside. Haven't I been telling you that repeatedly? Don't look at the outside. Don't look at the bank account, even though it's a fat bank account. Don't look at the bow legs and the curly hair. Don't 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 look at the the stick on edges because that, that could pull off. Don't don't look at the weave. Don't don't look at that. Not that there's nothing wrong with weave. Don't don't look at those things. What he can explain now. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, even though he looked kingly, even though he have the attributes externally of one who could be ordained as a king. He say, I have refused him. Why? This is key. For the Lord see it not as man see it. What you mean? Excuse me. For man look on the outward appearance, but the Lord 
look on the heart. Mm -hmm. Now, with that principle in mind, when God chose Rebecca for Isaac, do you think he was looking at her beauty? Do you think he looked at the cut in a nice long dress? Do you think he was looking at any of that external stuff? No, because he just told you why. He says, no, I know she's going to be a good wife. I know she's going to be prudent. I know she will be faithful to him. I know she will be the perfect help meet for him. So I'm saying to you again, who best would be to consult in seeking God's choice for your life? I don't need no pastor. Or pay, I don't need the only thing I need a pastor or any religious person for. If I ever do go there, will be for a confirmation. But I ain't going there to say, "Well, if pastor tell me, then this the one." No, 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 not not when you couldn't even keep your own together. No, that's why I tell you, I I'm a realist. Don't come to me and say, Kevin, what you discern, Kevin, what you what I think. Do I look like God to you? Huh? I can't see a poison heart. No, I can't. Now, mind you, I could see some attributes if I spend some time with them to see if they have those attributes to tell you you could possibly be on the right track. But in any event, even if you ask to go confirm this with God, I can't tell you to marry. You ain't going to make me shoulder this if things don't wake up. No. So go to God. It says, God, unlike man, watch this now, the Lord see it not as man see it, for man looked on the outward appearance, but the Lord look on the heart. You all hear this? We finish. Let's look at our, our last scripture. We finish. Let's go to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, beginning at verse 5. Jeremiah 17. Let's go here. And we're going to end right here. Jeremiah chapter 17. Where are we? Right there. I love it. Verse 5, I love scripture, that's right, I love it. That's the, the, this is why I don't need to be going to no pastor. Not to say that God can't speak to the pastor, you know. Not that I, God can't speak to my mother, or because my mother, everybody else can tell you, well, Kevin, well, I, I like them. I think there's a nice poison to you. And what is that based on? Based on the niceness they perform in front of you. So your, uh, your uh, advice is based on limited information, such as the pastor, if he's not in the vein of God or he's not operating out of a perspective of discernment. But if he's, if I if I talk to him about already and I say, but hey, pastor, listen, I met this girl, man, listen, she, she is, she's fine, but forget being fine. She's a lawyer, bro. She's a lawyer. You hear that? you? She's a lawyer. Yeah, she's a lawyer. Wow, man, that's good, man. That's very good. Why is good? Why is good that she's a lawyer? How come it's good because her pro so I guess if she was a doctor or an engineer that'd have been good. So what have I said? What have I said? What have I said? Well, she passed, I got a good one here. Pastor, listen, she fine, but she's washed this to Burger King. She listen, listen, she just was promoted the hair dishwasher. I wonder if he would say that's good. Boy, I hope you all listen to me. I hope you all listen to what I say to you all, you know, because I train you, if you go on human perspectives, if you go on human view, at the end of the day, you can't blame them because you bring in a matter where only God know the end from the beginning to a mere model to make an assessment. And the only assessment they could make is based on their knowledge of this poison. Or what they see. So Rev, how come when I told you about the lawyer I dated, it didn't work out, but you said, man, that was good, man, Kevin, I'm happy for you. Man, you got a whole lawyer, whole lawyer, not even half a lawyer, whole lawyer for you. Now, Rev, I come and I tell you, man, I meet this nice girl, you know, and she was just promoted to head, dish. she ain't just a dishwasher, she's the head chief dishwasher, that's right, so she, she, they let her watch only her could wash the china, not, not the rest, because they're not the head dishwasher. She's the head. Rev, how come you didn't say, man, that's good? How come, Rev, make me understand, because I'm, I'm beginning to believe what Kevin said. 
Kevin said, we live in a society beginning from the church, go straight down, where people assess things based on its cosmetics, based on the aesthetics, based on, on whether they determine it's something nice or bad. But there are really no uh, uh, protocols in place such as faithfulness, such as commitment, such as loyalty, such as prudence, such as wise, such as uh, being good. None of that. So the decision that she was a good person was because lawyer equate to money. If I said she was a doctor, doctor equate to having a lot of money. If I said she was an engineer, engineer equate to having a lot of money. But when I said she was not just a dishwasher, I even throw in a little title there. I said she was a top dishwasher. <laughs> Boy, <laughs> amen. Glory to God. Ha ha. Ooh, <laughs> I don't know about that one. You don't know about that one. So how come she isn't good? Because he would have just proven to you that his decisions, his assessments is not based on the qualities that scripture is requiring us to look for. It is based on what society has impregnated him and many others with. And what is that? Only if it looked prosperous, only if it coming from these types of areas that we deem to be success, now we label it as good. I'm trying to help you. So let's see why you shouldn't be listening to man when it comes to making the decision for the one that God has appointed for you in the future. Watch this. So Jeremiah 17 verse 5, thus said the Lord, okay, curse, I want you to write down that word, because whenever you see the word curse, and I can skip through all of the long definition and give you one word for the definition. Whenever you see the word curse, it is synonymous with limitation. It is synonymous with stagnation. It is not synonymous with hindrance. So when you see the word curse, you're limited. If someone say you are cursed, you are limited in life. You could never reach your full potential because to bless means for you to be, to be fortunate, to excel, to go ahead, to be catapulted, to keep moving. There's no restrictions in your life. So when you see the word curse, put curse equals limitation. So the Bible says, thus said the Lord, Jeremiah 17 verse 5, curse or limited be the man that trusts in who? that put his trust in another man. In so much words, before I go to God and says, God, this is the person I'm interested in. I am seeking, just like uh, the, the, the servant of Abraham's house. Even though Abraham didn't give him a picture to see who to look for, even though he didn't give him no, no marks in order to say, okay, well, that would be the one because you have a bite marker in an idiot. No, he went there having no idea who he's looking for. So what did he do? He went before God. And then he said to God, now God, this is what I would want to see happen. So I would know if this is the person for me. So he didn't go to a man. He went to God. So we get the result of when you go to God. God is saying here to everyone, listen to me right now. According to Jeremiah 17, verse 5, thus said the Lord, curse or limited would be the man that put his trust in man and make it flesh his arm. Another translation said, I'll make flesh his strength in life or to make flesh his resources or to make flesh his counsel. And whose heart, mm -hmm, do what? Departed from the Lord. How do you know his heart departed from the Lord? Well, why didn't he go to God to consult as to whether or not this was, this was for him or not? Why didn't? Why all of the decisions that he make, he got to go to mommy or daddy or sister or brother or pastor or reverend or apostle, but he never goes to God. So the Bible says, it's easy to answer that. His heart has departed from God. He's limited even before he get in this situation that will make his limitation even worse. Oh, I'm trying to help someone. Thus said the Lord, curse be the man or limited is the man that trusts in man and make flesh his arm and whose heart departed from the Lord. Okay, I see that part. But let's, let's talk about the people who would actually listen to God and listen to Kevin who's telling them about the rules of God. Verse 6 of Jeremiah 17. Sorry, no, no, no. We, we can continue with the curse man. Now, verse 5, sorry, tell us that a person will be limited in life 
If he seeks counsel that only God can give him about something that he has no knowledge of, if he seeks this in another person, he is automatically, there's a curse automatically levied on his life. So the Bible is now going to describe in verse 6 what this limited person would be like. It's almost as if they are in, under a spell or in a trance. So verse 6 is still referring to the cursed man in verse 5. For he, the one who is limited, the one who is cursed, for he shall, listen to this, shall be like the heat in the desert. You know how uncomfortable that is, right? And shall, this is the part I love, and shall not see when good cometh, mighty God. The Bible says that the curse that is on your life, that even when the good person come in your life, even when the faithful one come, even when the prudent one, the wise one, the good one come, you wouldn't even recognize them. I love scriptures. I love the Bible. I love it. I love it. You all hear this? You could imagine if you didn't have these rules. The Bible, this is why a man could look at a woman and say, because she have a title or because her, bo her, her brother is a drug dealer and she is pretty, that's why he will hook up with her. But this one over here, this one over here, okay, she's still pretty, but she in what's happening. She, everybody in behind her. Because he is cursed, because he is limited, even his eyes are dim in terms of vision. So what happened? Even when good come to him, even when the right one come to his life, he wouldn't be able to recognize, this is God's best for me. This is God's choice for me. Why? Because he is under the spell of this world. And what is the spell of this world, Mr. Ewing? The spell of this world is everything that you are about to assess, you must make your assessment from a materialistic, superficial, cosmetic, surface perspective. It must have no depth. It must have no research. You don't need none of that. Take it for face value and connect with it to create a lifelong relationship that will never last. Mighty God, I love it. I love it. I love it. So listen to what it says, verse 6. For he shall be like the heat in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. Meaning that not only will he be in the wilderness where there's nothing there, the parch means the dry, the arid places, meaning that there will be no peace in his life. There will be no joy in his life. He will not enjoy his life. Why? Simply because his assessments are made from a superficial perspective and not the principles of God in terms of looking for the quality of poison that could more than likely be his future mate that God had put aside just for him. Mighty God. So watch this, let's go to verse 7. Now let's talk about the guys who will see God. Let's, let's see what they're dealing with. So verse 7 of Jeremiah 17. Bl hold on, hold on. Blessed is the man, listen, that trusted in the Lord, mighty God. Who's this man? That sounds like Abraham's servant. Now God, I come before you. I come to the God of my master, Abraham. I come to him because I've been watching his life and I see a come true for him. Now, I don't know who Isaac's wife supposed to be, but you, I know, know all things. So here's what I want you to do for me. I ain't as deep as Abraham. So let's do this thing like kindergarten. I tell you what. So if I go to this thing, let the woman who's supposed to be Isaac's wife, let her offer me some water, which I will readily take. And to truly confirm it, let her now volunteer to give these camels some water. What is he doing? He's trusting in the Lord. He isn't putting his trust in pastor who make mistakes like everybody else. And that's not to say don't listen to pastor counsel. But pastor, I can tell you now, now that I know better, you ain't the final counsel. The final counsel is God. So he says, blessed be the man that trusted in the Lord and whose hope, whose expectation, that's what the word hope means, whose expectation the Lord is. Father, I trust in you. 
And my expectation is that you who know all things, you can answer me. You can tell me if this is the woman here. You can tell me if she's the woman. You are going, I am, my confidence is that you will show me. So he says, blesses the man that trusted in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Listen, listen. For he shall be as a tree, mighty God, planted by the waters. That sounds like continual resources to me. And that spread it out her roots by the river and shall not see when the heat come, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful or worried in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. He says, while CNN, while Huffington Post, while CBS News and every other news forecasting a drought is coming, while all of the eggs in the food store is nine and ten dollars per, per, per crate, while everybody crying, you got a pinch here and there. The Bible says, This man whose trust is in the Lord, who seeks counsel from the Lord, guess what? He he his he don't worry, he ain't listening to nobody else other than what does said the Lord. And God already tell this brother, not only. Look how he described the one who believe and trusts God. The way that he is describing this man, he'll basically be a tree of life. People will come to pick food off of him, even while everybody else is having drought, while everybody else is going through their trouble. This, this is the one lighthouse of resources right here. The Bible says, listen to this piece, I love it. He shall be, the Bible says, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful. That word careful meaning that they will not be worried, anxious, or concerned in the year of drought. The word drought means in the year of recession. Okay? Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Hold on. So you mean even in the year of recession, you will be yielding fruit? Yeah, I, I'm a witness, so I know just what the Bible is talking about here. I know exactly what the scripture is talking about there. That don't affect me. Why? Because before the drought came, before the high prices came, what were you doing, Mr. Ewing? I was sowing in the life of the poor. I was going where God sent me to go to bless people, not advertising it, not putting up a banner and say, listen to what I do. I give my gifts and arms in secret. And guess what? The mere fact that I'm still yielding food in the drought, God says, I will reward you openly. See, I know the rules. I know the rules. See, when you abide by the rules, you will always come on top. You will always come on top. So again, while others are there condemning, while others are saying, okay, because this sin you don't do, you sorry, this sin I don't do, but you just do it. Well, I can preach this for 24 years and just pound it and, and forget everything else in life. I just want the world to know that you is a this and you is a that. And every time you come here, I can tell you why you are not meeting the mark. Don't worry, but that one over there. You keep going and pressing towards the mark. You keep following the rules, the laws, and the principles. And God is going to sustain you. You don't got to worry about them. They don't do nothing for you. They, they Let them back all they want. They are not the one paying your bills. They are not the one giving you the resources. They are not the one blessing you. And thank God, because if they were the one, you really would have been up the creek. But you better thank Jesus even in that, that they are not the one who, would have, who God would have left responsible for helping you. Why? Because when you don't meet their standard, not the standard of the Bible, when you don't meet their standard, then they got to cut you off. They got to call you names. You got to, you, you got to, you got to be second class. No boy. Uh, uh, no, no, no. So the scriptures are clear. We done. The scriptures are very, very, very clear. And I will end with this. The Bible says in the book of Corinthians, very, very clear. He said, excuse me, if our gospel or the good news of the rules and regulations and principles and ordinance of God be hid. It is only hid from those who are lost, in whom the God of this world, he's talking about Satan now, has blinded their minds, not their eyes, their minds. I prefer to have these eyes blinded than this mind. Because even if this blind, I still could think, I still could reason, I still could receive knowledge assimilated and now know how to distribute or act in wisdom how to, to handle this knowledge. But he said he has blinded their minds. So with that said, and you go back to 
Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 6, which it talks about now the consequences of the limited man, the cursed man. He said the limited man, he says he will be like a uh, heat in the desert and in the parched uh, areas of the wilderness that even when good, when things that are beneficial to him come, he's like a robot. He's just he like he under spell. Good things in life coming to him. And you know what he said? No, oh, no, I can't take that. No, I got to ask. I got to ask my spiritual father. I got to ask Papa. I got to ask Papa. I got to ask Papa. Why is this happening? It says, if the gospel of Jesus Christ be hid, if the rules that only one man could cover this poison, if he ever come to that understanding that only Jesus Christ, who have died and shed his blood, is the only poison deputized by God the Father to cover anybody, the day he come into that knowledge, he will stop this foolishness. But as long as he he put his trust and his faith in a human, in another woman, in another part, whoever, the Bible says he has invoked the spirit, which is called a curse of limitations on his life. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the wisdom and the knowledge that you're giving us in these series of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We thank you, Lord, for the, the many young people or people and women and men who are not married yet and who were frustrated, especially the women who wanted to start their family, who wanted to move on in life, and they couldn't understand that I am following all of the rules that God say and Kevin say and everybody else say, why isn't my life panning out? Why haven't I met my intended? Have I met my intended as yet? But you're seeing it right in the scriptures. You were never prepared to meet them because you are not faithful. You are not committed. You like the ideology or the idea of marriage. You like the presentation that, hey, look, now I'm married. Now I have my husband, but you don't know how to treat him. You don't know how to cook for him. You don't know. He don't even know how to treat you. None of y'all have the qualities that is required in the book of Proverbs that you ought to be looking for in each other. So God never allowed you to make the mistake of connecting with something that you weren't supposed to be with. God did not want you to become a statistic. So through these messages for those who are not married, he's saying to you, observe my laws, put your trust in me. And if you put your trust in me, you will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that even when the hard times come, even when the drought come, you will still be bearing fruit. While those who got the nice, handsome lawyers, doctors, Indians, and chief crying today, hollering today, because that was not the proper nuts and bolts to sustain this union going forward. God said, while you were thinking that I wasn't looking at you, while you thought I forgot you, while you thought I was ignoring you, while you were getting tired of being bridesmaid or bride, uh, whatever in these weddings, and when was it going to be your time? I was preserving you. It wasn't me. I was waiting for you to get your stuff together. But yet you become conformed to this world. How was that, Kevin? Because you was making your assessment all the time based on the externals, based on the world standard. You never, like my servant, been instructing you, you've never looked for wisdom in these people. You never look for good or how they are, it would be beneficial to not just themselves, but to the relationship. You never look for unity, synergy. You never look for oneness. In fact, you told your friends that whoever you get married to, you're signing a prenup. I don't know what for. You only got $500 in the bank. So God is saying, you were missing your appointed schedule times because you never got your act together. Get your act together. Don't worry about who got their act together. You get your to, yours together, and I will assist you in guiding you to your who? To your what? To your appointed person. So, Father, we bless you. Father, we honor you. Father, we praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, folks, that is it for me. Listen, as usual, you know, I... I I don't know when to end these things, but it's be too juicy. It is too ju the word of God. I'm sure y'all would agree with me. It's too juicy. I know my wife was mad with me because guess what? We normally just go walking in the morning, right? And she had to go do something, so I she we couldn't go. We go together. So I promised her that I would go this evening when it's because the evening time will be cooler. But it's nighttime now, and I know I'm out long, and I know she mad at me. You see. 
but I'm going to go in there and I'm going to be a prudent man dog. <laughs> okay. I'm going to fix her a nice meal and show her how prudent I am. Huh? Show us some synergy. See? See, that's how you do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you don't go there and switch things, right? But on a serious note, though, play the videos over, share them with a friend, especially if that friend is getting married. They need to hear these things from the beginning. And tomorrow, God spares life. Once I get into, well, if I get to do the video tomorrow, because I have an appointment tomorrow, but once I get to do the video tomorrow, we're going to go into the adultery part of it, okay? And it's, it's going to be right on time because on Saturday, we go straight into the divorce section. I want to cover a little piece on the, on the adultery thing to get a full understanding as opposed to the one-sided view of what adultery is. We want to see exactly what Jesus said, his... Uh, amendment to the terminology of adultery. Adultery, clearly, based on what Jesus said, fall under the category of fornication. So adultery and for the amendment rule or law of, forn of adultery, according to Jesus, Matthew 5, verses 27, 28. So fornication is synonymous. It's synonymous with adultery. You don't have to be married to the person. Sorry, you don't. You don't have to be married to the person you engaging sexually with. Don't have to. Be, none of y'all, even if y'all are not married, and you're all committing fornication, that's adultery. If you're not physically doing the act, but looking at a person and lusting after them, and in your mind putting them in sexual positions, according to the Bible, not me. That's why I read to understand. You are in adultery. So if you have a problem with lust. Just how you would call a person who was married before and they a spouse to live in, you will call them a perpetual adulterer. So are you. So I really wanted to get that out there because when we jump in it tomorrow, I will explain some more on it. So again, going forward, I want you to have a full understanding. So at the end of these series, at the end of all of this, again, we're not here to say this one wrong, this one right. What we're saying is we're independent of all of that. We want a concise understanding. So when we go forward, it ain't because of what Kevin say, it ain't because of what this one say. We read it for ourselves, we define the words, and this is the conclusion of the matter. Whether you were against me or not, it don't matter to me. I want you, what, what did you get from it? I'm not here to bully you and I ain't gonna bully you. All I'm doing is laying out the rules to you, all right? So God bless you. You have a good evening and you continue to pray for me as I continue to pray for you.